Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. Mr. Secretary, will you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Carlton. <clears throat> Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Here. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Flores. Present. Assemblyman Frierson. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman Kasama. Here. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Assemblywoman Tolls. Chair Howdy. Here. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Please mark members present um, as they arrive. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I just, I do want to uh, make note that we will be starting at one o'clock on Wednesday as well and have an earlier start time on Friday. I plan to follow this schedule into next week as well, just because we will have um, heavier agendas. So just make sure to note the start times on the agendas as they are posted, as they will change from our regularly scheduled 1.30 afternoon meetings. Um, before we start, I'd like to go through some housekeeping announcements. Please remember all exhibits, written testimony, and amendments must be submitted by noon on the day prior to the scheduled committee meeting. People who wish to provide testimony or attend the meeting virtually must pre-register online at the legislature's website. The public is strongly encouraged to submit written testimony in advance by emailing the Assembly Commerce and Labor Committee. Zoom chat is reserved strictly for committee business only. Members, please remember to keep your camera on at all times. This will help us ensure that we have a quorum unless you are stepping away for non-committee related business. Members and presenters, please remember to be muted at all times, unmute yourself to speak, and then promptly mute yourself right after. Thank you, everyone, and let's begin with our agenda. We have four bills on the agenda today, Assembly Bill 200, Assembly Bill 210, Assembly Bill 227, and Assembly Bill 330. I will be taking the items out of order, and I will start with um, Assembly Bill 210. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 210, and I believe we have Assembly Member Steve Yeager here to present the bill. Mr. Yeager, welcome to the Committee on Commerce and Labor, and when you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, Chair Howdegy, Vice Chair Carlton, members of the Assembly Commerce and Labor Committee. My name is Steve Yeager. I represent Assembly District 9, which is located in Southwest Las Vegas. It is my pleasure this afternoon to make very brief introductory remarks for Assembly Bill 210 before handing it over to two experts who are with us here on the Zoom, and they will take you through the bill and then answer any questions that you may have. Assembly Bill 210 seeks to put the Chiropractic Physicians Board of Nevada in a position to be proactive to ensure public safety as well as reduce unnecessary hurdles for licensure. And that is my brief remark. And Madam Chair, with your permission, I would love to hand it over to uh, Dr. Maggie Colucci, Board President of the Chiropractic Physicians Board of Nevada, and Julie Strandberg, who is the Executive Director of that same board. And they will have a chance to review the bill, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Assembly Member Yeager. And we are ready for the next presenters. Hello, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Margaret Colucci. I am a chiropractic physician practicing in Las Vegas and the board president and legislative liaison for the Chiropractic Physicians Board of Nevada. The general intent of our bill address is four issues. First, to authorize the board to register, inspect, and regulate chiropractic practices that are not wholly owned by Nevada licensed chiropractic physicians. Second, to harmonize language throughout our practice act to use the current and modern term chiropractic physician. Second, and, and replace the older term chiropractor. Third, to update our licensing statutes to lessen barriers to licensing in the hope of encouraging retention and recruitment 
of more chiropractic physicians in Nevada. And fourth, to authorize chiropractic physicians to recommend, dispense, or administer lawful over-the-counter products. Madam Chair, that was a brief highlight of what the board is seeking. Would you like me to go through each of the cha changes section by section, or would you prefer that we are available for questions? If you could, Ms. Kalichi, walk us through um, section by section. I think that would be helpful for us on the committee. Absolutely. So we'll start with section two of this bill defines business entity and is new language to the board, Board's Practice Act. The board's intent of this section is to authorize the board to register, inspect, and regulate chiropractic practices that are not wholly owned by Nevada licensed chiropractic physicians or that are not otherwise already regulated such as medical uh, facilities or practices owned by medical doctors or chiropractors of osteopath or doctors of osteopathy. Recent investigations and cases have demonstrated the need for this limited authority because the board can effectuate positive remediation against the licensees, but the board has no and changes to practices wholly owned by licensees by taking action against the licensees, but the board has no similar authority to effectuate positive remediation where the practices are not owned by Nevada chiropractic physicians. Our experience has been that practices not owned by Nevada licensees are presently beyond the board's reach and thus are allowed to practice unregulated and compete unfairly with the practices that the board does not regulate. The board sees this section as leveling the playing field for all, all chiropractic practices. Section three, this new language does four things. One, it establishes the requirement for registration of business entities with the board. Two, establishes that the business entity re registration is annual and expires on June 1. Three, it allows the board to approve a late renewal accompanied by the renewal fee and the additional late fee. And four, requires notification of the board substantive changes in the business entity in writing within 30 days after the change. Section four, this new language does three things. One, it makes the business entity responsible to assure that it is employed chiropractic physicians and chiropractic assistants comply with Nevada's statutes and regulations. Subsection two requires the establishment of policies and procedures relating to the patient records and how patients may obtain copies of this business entity ceases upon operation. And subsection three requires the board entity to notify the board no later than 30 days after its dissolution. Sections five and six harmonize language pertaining to business entities. Section seven amends NRS 634.090 to reflect the board's intent to increase potential pool of chiropractic physicians who might be interested in coming to Nevada. This intent is shown in the three sections the board seeks to amend. First, the change to subsection one strikes old language that attempted to dictate the subject matter of colleges of chiropractic. The existing language precedes the nationwide scope of the accreditation by the CCE, Council on Chiropractic Education. That language and approach is now outdated. Almost all three chiropractic, almost all chiropractic schools are now CCE accredited. The language, although, is slightly broader to authorize the acceptance of college, colleges of chiropractic that are not CCE accredited, but are, but are accredited by federal or Nevada accrediting bodies. This may broaden the pool of potential candidates who might apply to Nevada. Second, the new language in subsection uh, two authorizes an experienced chiropractic physician working at least seven of the preceding 10 years who passed his or her examinations at a time when parts three and part four of the National Board of Chiropractic Examin Examiners did not exist when he or she became licensed. This language makes it easier for older and more experienced chiropractic physicians to become licensed in Nevada, and the board hopes that this will bring more licensees to the state of Nevada who are in good standing and seasoned in the practice of chiropractic. Third, the change in subsection six adds language to ensure that a foreign graduate who has taken a course of study consistent, consisting of at least 4,000 hours and produces a degree of chiropractic, doctor of chiropractic can seek licensure. By this language, the board seeks to assure that the education of a foreign graduate is consistent and equivalent with the U.S. graduates whose schools are CC accredited. 
Section 8 through 15 and Section 17 through 19 and 21 harmonize the language pertaining to business entities. Section 16 amends NRS 634.220 to authorize chiropractic physicians to recommend, dispense, and administer over-the-counter drugs and devices. While this practice has long been engaged in by the Nevada's chiropractic physicians, the board wanted to clarify the authority by making it explicit in statute. Section 20 amends NRS 4.9.215 to include chiropractic physicians within the definition of doctor for purposes of privileging and protecting communications between the chiropractic physician and his or her patient in legal proceedings. Section 22, directive language requiring that all references to chiropractor throughout the NRS and NEC to be changed to chiropractic physician and all references to chiropractor's assistant to chiropractic assistant throughout the NRS and NEC. Julie, do you have anything to add, Ms. Strandberg? Oh, Ms. Strandberg, I believe you're muted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that was the end of our presentation for AB 210. And um, I would be glad to answer any questions the chair of the committee members might have. Um, thank you for your time and your consideration of our bill. Thank you, Ms. Strandberg. Committee members, any questions? Ms. Member Kasama, we'll start with you. Assembly Member Kasama? Yes, sorry, okay. trying to find my unmute button. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just curious if you're going to address the amendment that was um, as part of the exhibit. Ms. Kasama, I believe that the uh, the entity who proposed the amendment is will be testifying in support and walking through the amendment when we get to um, testimony and support. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Oh, Vice Chair Carlton, please. Thank you. And I guess I just really want to understand the problem that we're trying to fix when it comes to businesses that aren't totally owned by chiropractors. Uh, we've always been very careful to make sure that licensing boards don't overreach and try to go into areas that they, they shouldn't. They have jurisdiction over chiropractors, but not other folks. So I'm, if I could just get an example of what the problem is and what you're trying to fix, that might make this a little more clear. Julie, did you want to address right, that? Through, or? Yeah, through you, Chair. Sorry to Assemblyman. Um, I um, so the the gist behind doing this is not to, as you mentioned, we don't want to overstep. We have recognized some circumstances through some complaints that the board has received of ownership where there is no chiropractic physician as being part of that ownership. So our concern is the board doesn't have any jurisdiction to um, reach out to these groups or corporations or other business people who own these chiropractic practices who may require certain things be done by chiropractors we can only um, discipline the chiropractor for the chiropractic physician um, for stepping outside of the, the boundaries um, of the chiropractic NRS and NAC 634. So if I may, Madam Chair, would this give you jurisdiction over that business even though they aren't chiropractors? Correct. So if, okay. yeah. That's, that's, that, that's what I really want to understand is why, why we would need that um, because the chiropractor works for the entity is not an actual part owner of the entity. You have jurisdiction over the chiropractor. Having jurisdiction over a business is a, is a little bit more than, than 
what your regulatory body is actually geared for. So I guess I'm just still trying to understand why you would want jurisdiction over this business. I can give just a slight example that we've where we've dealt with the situation where a, um, a chiropractic practice may or may not follow um, the law when it comes to um, completing patient records. So when the board requests those records, they are not in compliance with the board um, regulations and statutes. So, but we can, the chiropractor is following the rules set by their ownership. And that's where the, I guess there's a fine line there. I understand what you're saying. And I'm trying to remember, do we do this in any other cases? Do we allow any other boards to have jurisdictions over business entities that you know of? I, I, I'm, I don't believe we do, but there may be one out there that I missed. I know I, I was my understanding and I have to reassess. I was thinking that there was um, the veterinarians. They had some oversight over their practices, but maybe in a different manner. So I could be wrong. But I just know that other states um, it, um, under their chiropractic language do um, register the entity. And if I may, Madam Chair, this will this will be my last one. And thank you for the latitude. So. Uh, do you do you have legal counsel on staff or do you use a DAG? Um, I, we have legal counsel on staff. And this came from your legal counsel? This recommendation? Yes. Um, actually, it came from um, a, a board member or a previous board member, I should say. Okay. And may I ask who your legal counsel currently is? Louis Ling. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you, Vice Chair Carlton, for the questions. And members, any other questions? I have a question. <clears throat> I'm sorry, who? Everyone oh, hand. yes, please. Yes, um, under uh, Section 2, Subsection 5, it says the board shall impose an administrative fine in the amount prescribed by a regulation of the board against a register for that doesn't comply with the requirements of subsection four, do we have a set amount or is that based on what they violate? All right, let me just check back here real quick. You're, I'm sorry, um, this is Julie Strandberg for the record. You're referring to the registration fee? I'm sorry. No, it's a, uh, Assembly woman B. Duran to uh, Julie Stenberg. Sorry about that. It is on page three, line 32, number five. It says the board shall impose an administrative fine in the amount prescribed by a regulation of the board against a registrant who does not, that does not comply with the requirements of subsection four. This is section one. Subsection five, I believe, or, yeah, or section three, subsection five. Julie Strandberg, for the record, I believe that is we would have to um, come back through um, the legislation or legislative committee to address that in our regulation, to set that fee in our regulation. Follow up, Chair? Yes. yes. So, in other, so we don't have anything now that would have a have a requirement. We'd have to wait till next session to come back. Julie Strandberg, for the record, um, it would, I believe, we would set that in our in our administrative code. So it would it would be to the legislative committee during the interim that we would have to come back and visit that to set those fees. Or set that be. Thank you. Thank you, Member Duran. And I believe, uh, Ms. Strandberg, what you meant is you would have to come during the interim to the legislative uh, legislative commission, interim committee on. Thank you. Your regulations. 
uh, before the next legislative session. And Vice Chair Carlton, I just um, I was just notified that it looks like the legal counsel, Mr. Ling, is actually on with us. Did you want him to address your questions, Vice Chair? And no, thank you, Madam Chair. I I was just curious as to whether we they had a DAG or whether they had counsel on. But if 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 I could expand upon the previous question, I'm always very concerned about setting fees in regulation and not setting them in statute. We typically set the top amount and then they work up to a certain amount. Um, allowing a board to set a fee in regulation um, is just uh, contradictory to how we've done it in the past and I would just hate to open that door and have every board start setting their fees and regulation. Um, I think we would lose control of the scheme of how the boards are supposed to operate. So I would be cautious on that front. Okay, members, um, any other questions? I'm checking my messages. Okay, um, Assembly Member Yeager, I believe you had to add something to add to the presentation. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Steve Yeager, for the record. Before we move on to testimony, I, I did just want to address um, Assemblywoman Kasama's question about uh, the proposed amendment. Um, at this time, we are viewing that as friendly, but to be candid to the committee, I think we're still trying to work through some of the nuances of that amendment, but we do have Mr. Vander Pol on, who I think will address that amendment. And then I also wanted to let members know that um, you, you will be receiving a second amendment. We were pretty late to the game, but I just want to explain it quickly because I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but I was reached out to by members of the Clark County Public Defender's Office, and they had some concerns. Um, it's section 18 of the bill, which if you have the bill in front of you would be page 13 of the bill. And if you look down there about line 15 or 16, there was a creation of a new uh, a new felony offense, a category B felony, they had requested that uh, we consider making that a category D as in David, uh, rather than a category B as in boy. And that was something that um, I was receptive to. And I believe the other individuals who spoke are as well. So I anticipate if this gets to a work session that you'll see that amendment as well. But unfortunately, we, we were not timely in submitting that to the committee. Uh, but wanted to flag that to the committee. And I think Mr. Pirro may be on the phone as well to provide any additional clarification or testimony on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assembly Member Yeager. Okay, committee, last call for questions. Okay, seeing no hands, I am gonna move into testimony in support. I'm gonna start with uh, Mr. Vanderpool who can um, address the amendment that you all saw on NALIS. Mr. Vanderpool? Good afternoon, Chair. Support. Yeah, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Nick Vanderpool with Capital Partners here, here today with the Nevada Chiropractic Association. Um, we are in support of Assembly Bill 210 and actually worked with uh, uh, the Nevada Chiropractic Board before it went to uh, draft. Um, it was it was an excellent, uh, the association had the chance to review the bill um, and, and support the, the bill as, as it's uh, written and, and respect Assemblyman Yeager's uh, amendment that he's bringing forward. The amendment that we're bringing forward is, uh, is what we consider a, a, a fix that we weren't able to fix in uh, 2019 to Assembly Bill 147. And it basically uh, allows uh, various qualified medical spe specialists to uh, treat children who sustained a, a head injury. And during that time in, in 2019, we added physician's assistants and advanced practice registered nurses. And um, we attempted to get the uh, chapter 634 added, but it became late to the game. And uh, we were told to wait until 2021 to try to make this fix. And so we've been working with the board um, in the interim, let them know that we would like to bring this forward. We thought about bringing this to, as a, uh, a separate bill, but uh, it, at the end, it, it was uh, the best intent just to bring a friendly amendment. Um, I do have on the phone, Dr. David uh, Rovetti, uh, who is with the Nevada Chiropractic Association, and uh, he can spec speak to the technical terms uh, and the education of a, a chiropractor who, um, and their education as it relates to this 
uh, specific uh, request. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Assemblymember Kasama, I know you had a question regarding the um, amendment, and I told you we'd be hearing about it in testimony. So I do want to give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you had regarding the amendment. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to hear the um, the doctor's explanation because it just seems so different from the bill, the main bill. When I was looking at the amendment, um, you know, regarding head injuries. So um, certainly, like to hear the testimony. Okay. And Dr. Rovetti, were you going to be testifying? Are you available for questions from Assemblymember Kasama? I see that we have you on. I am. Okay. Yes. Welcome, Dr. Rovetti. Okay. The uh, uh, the bill basically states that uh, we're able to return um, injured sports participants back into the uh, back into the game, uh, whether it's right away or it's after a couple days or a couple weeks or, or eventually possibly never. Um, and we feel that the chiropractors are qualified for that. There's uh, two specific classes in almost every chiropractic college that uh, speaks to the area of, of concussion diagnosis, treatment, uh, prognosis. Uh, that would be like a neuro, neuroanatomy class. There's also a cervical spine anatomy and pathology class. Um, and the, the last one is, is more of a hands-on. Uh, here's when you return to to play here's if you don't here's when you refer them to a specialist um and uh, also the um uh, all chiropractors are tested on this through, uh, through our national boards uh, there's four parts to our national bo boards um part two uh multiple choice questions it's uh it talks about that uh and there is it on that and then also part three two more multiple choice, but more clinically oriented uh, test on that too. And that's according to the uh, director of uh, testing for the national board. Um, it's been so long since I took those, I don't, can't remember exactly what parts test it. But so we feel we, we're, we're very well trained for it. Uh, we have the education, we're very well tested for uh, that duty. So um, I think it's a shoe in that we should be included in that uh, list of uh, medical providers that um, have that privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rivetti. We appreciate you being here to help answer the questions on the amendment. Okay, broadcasting, we don't see no one else signed up to testify on video. Can we check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in support? Oh, I apologize before we go. Oh, I just know. Vice Chair Carlton, did you have a question for Dr. Rovetti? Yes, I did. And I, I think there's some confusion out there. Um, about the actual doctor and chiropractor. Some doctors, some folks in chiropractic do have medical degrees and some don't. This may be a question more for the board. Are all the chiropractors in this state have medical degrees or did they just graduate from a chiropractic college and does that give them a medical degree? Hi, this is Dr. Uh, Margaret Colucci. Uh, we don't have medical degrees. We have doctor of chiropractic degrees. Um, there is additional training that chiropractors can do to become um, certified as a chiropractic sport physician. That's extra training or specialty type of programs. So coming out with a doctor of chiropractic, we have the knowledge to treat musculoskeletal injuries, but regarding with specifics with sporting events and additional training for more emergency purposes, that is something that is an additional type of certification certification or a diplomat that the doctor can, or chiropractic can receive. So just, just to clarify, it's not an actual medical degree. It's considered a doctorate in chiropractic? It's a doctor of chiropractic degree. We, we go to school for four years of pre-med, just like a medical doctor. And then we go an additional um, five years or three and a half all year round. Uh, for the doctor of chiropractic degree. We study the same materials as the medical doctors. We, we are trained in x-ray, diagnosis, examination. We just don't prescribe medications. Okay, I just think it's good for us to clarify because in using the same terminology, people can get confused. So I'm, I'm glad you were able to clarify that for the committee. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you, Vice Chair. Okay, broadcasting. Let's try this again. Let's go to the telephone line for those wishing to testify in support. Yes, sure. To testify in support 
on AB 210, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in support of AB 210, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 611, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Assembly Commerce and Labor Committee. This is John Pirro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. Uh, at this time, we are in support because we understand that Assemblyman Yeager is going to accept our uh, friendly amendment which we did submit late, so I apologize for that. It would change section 18 of the bill, uh, subsection 4B from a category B felony back down to a category D felony, which matches the penalty structure for other crimes relating to this area. And we're grateful for Assemblyman Yeager for accepting that amendment. Thank you, that concludes my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Pirro. Um, broadcasting next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. Next, we will hear testimony in opposition. Can we check the telephone line for anyone wishing to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 210? Yes, Chair. To testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 210, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Can we check the telephone line to see if there's anyone wishing to testify in the neutral position? To testify in neutral on AB 210, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Assembly Member Yeager, would you like to give any closing remarks? Thank you, Madam Chair. Steve Yeager, for the record. Just want to thank you for hearing this bill and, and thank you for accommodating me by taking the bill out of order. We'll continue to work on some of these issues and um, certainly would, would encourage any members to reach out to me or to my co-presenters if you have any questions uh, when you have a chance to look at the bill a second time. And uh, with that, I'm just very, very appreciative that you heard the bill, Madam Chair, and hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Assembly Member Yeager. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 210. Okay, members, now we will go to Assembly Bill 200. We will take the bills in order from here on out. I will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 200, which revises provisions governing veterinary medicine. We have Assembly Member Shannon Bilbrey Axelrod here with us this afternoon to present Assembly Bill 200. Assembly Member Bilbrey Axelrod, are you with us? I'm here. Welcome to the Committee on Commerce and Labor. When you're ready, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, I'm Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbray Axarod, representing Assembly District 34 within Clark County. I'm here to present Assembly Bill 200 for your consideration. In the digital age, telemedicine has emerged as one of the greatest opportunities and challenges facing medicine, both human and veterinary. Telemedicine, when properly implemented and regulated, facilitates consultation, patient monitoring, the delivery of consumer information, and provides patient care in underserved and remote areas. At this critical time when Nevadans are more reliant on technology than ever, Nevada has an opportunity to shape the direction of telemedicine for optimal animal health and welfare benefits. To date, Nevada law and regulations are silent regarding telemedicine. To ensure Nevada consumers can access the resources and benefits of telemedicine without sacrificing quality of care, AB 200 clearly authorizes the use of telemedicine in Nevada for the continued care of an animal that has previously been seen by a licensed Nevada veterinarian. AB 200 formally establishes and allows for telemedicine 
as a part of the Veterinary Practice Act in Nevada. The intent of AB 200 is to provide clarity for both the consumer and the veterinarian as appropriate use of telemedicine to treat Nevada animals. I want to briefly run through what the bill does. AB 200 firmly allows the licensed Nevada veterinarian to practice veterinary medicine in Nevada for animals that have been previously examined. The legislation affirms that the Nevada State Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners have clear authority to oversee the governance and acts of veterinary telemedicine. This is of critical importance. Not all telemedicine is good telemedicine. By embracing the board with clear authority over telemedicine practices, this legislation ensures that in this modern age, we're ensuring the highest level of consumer protection. The legislation will expand access to veterinary care. The legislation enables both clinical and education assistance to the underserved and remote populations. In addition, passage of this legislation will ensure Nevada animals receive veterinary medicine in the care of the highest level while following best practices on social distancing. This legislation also codifies the existing regulations that require a physical examination of an, of an animal to establish what is known as a veterinary client patient relationship. Telemedicine does not alone fulfill a veterinary's professional obligation for a thorough in-person examination, which employs all of the veterinary senses and expertise and elicits animal responses, all of which are imperative because veterinary patients cannot verbally convey, convey their histories or symptoms. To speak plainly, Nevada's pets and agriculture animals can't speak for themselves, and Nevada pet owners aren't professionally trained to assess the status of their pets and communicate that to the veterinarian. Accordingly, Nevada must adopt a responsible telemedicine policy in the state that takes account of the importantness of physical exams necessary to appropriate, appropriately take care of Nevada's animals. In requiring a physical exam in combination with the tools available through telemedicine, this legislation aligns Nevada law with federal law. Under federal law, an in-person physical exam of an animal and timely visit to the premise is required to establish veterinary and client patient relationship. And because it is the federal requirement, it applies to all states. This federal requirement of the veterinary and client patient relationship applies to any extra label drug use and the writing of the veterinarian feed directives. With the passage of AB 200, Nevada will be a nationwide leader establishing telemedicine as a tool for veterinary professionals while allowing the highest quality of consumer protection. With that, I would like to introduce Alyssa Naveworth, who will go through the sections of the bill, as well as Dr. Susie Costas and Dr. Morgan, who will join me with any further explanation of the need for AB 200. Um, for the record, I also will have Jennifer Pedigo, Dr. John Pinnell, and Michelle Wagner available by phone if there's any technical questions that we are unable to answer. Thank you, um, committee, for your consideration, and I will turn it over to Ms. Navor. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. It's an honor to join you today. Um, thank you, Chair Hadegui and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Alyssa Nayworth, and I'm here today on behalf of the Nevada Veterinary Medical Association. As Assemblywoman Billboard Axlog just mentioned, um, Michelle Wagner and John Pinnell, also of the association, are here with me. Should I not be able to answer technical questions you have with regard to this specific section-by-section -section analysis? I've been asked to walk through the legislation section by section, incorporating the conceptual amendment which has been placed on Nellis. I will start with section two. Section two of the proposed legislation defines for the first time veterinary telemedicine to include communication via telephone, video, mobile application, or online platform. In the conceptual amendment, we propose adding the terms of groups of animals to accommodate large animal and mixed animal agricultural practices and to ensure that all veterinarians in the state are able to access the tool of te veterinary telemedicine. Section three of the proposed legislation places the limitations of practice associated with telemedicine. When read in combination with the proposed conceptual amendment, the legislation provides that veterinarian may use telemedicine as an ongoing tool of treatment only once the veterinarian has established the quote unquote veterinary client patient relationship, which as the assemblywoman um, so aptly explained, is a technical tool of art 
governing veterinary medicine and its, its implementation. And that to do so, you must do so by a timely physical examination of an animal. In the conceptual amendment, we pose the following, section three, sub, subsection three, sub D, replacing the draft language with language drawn from the American Veterinary Medical Association Practice Act regarding emergency, emergency and urgent care to ensure that you can still uh, do emergency and urgent care in these circumstances, and striking subsection F, because we believe in conversations with the Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners that this is not necessary for the creation of the VCPR and therefore should be removed. This also brings the definition of the creation of the veterinary client-patient relationship in line with the federal definition of the VCPR. Section four of the proposed legislation allows for a licensed Nevada veterinarian who has established a VCPR to oversee a licensed veterinary technician via telemedicine. Section six revises the definition of the practice of veterinary medicine to include te telemedicine. And section seven, as revised by the proposed conceptual amendment, clarifies that a person practicing telemedicine in Nevada must be licensed by the state of Nevada. I want to thank Assemblywoman Bilberry Axrod for her leadership on this issue. And with that, I stand open for questions, or we can turn this over to the two practitioners with us, which are Dr. Morgan and Dr. Costa. Thank you again. Thank you. Assembly Member Bilberry Axelrod, would you like to turn it over to Dr. Morgan or Dr. Costa for presentation or are they? Yeah, that, that would be great, Chair, um, just because I think they'll really talk about the need for this bill briefly. Thank you. Dr. Morgan, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Do you want me to begin? Yes, when you're ready. Okay, thank you for allowing me to speak on this matter. Um, I apologize if I have to leave the session early. I do have appointments starting at about two o'clock. Um, as they said, my name is Dr. Morgan. Um, I'm a native Nevadan. I did my undergraduate at the University of Nevada, Reno on the Millennial Scholarship, and I went on as a witchy student to Washington State University for my DVM. Uh, since graduation, I have practiced at Elko Veterinary Clinic. We are the largest clinic in Northeastern Nevada. We are a mixed practice serving all species, and ours is the only practice that does after hours emergency care for Northeastern Nevada. Myself and the other doctors at my practice fully support AB 200 for a number of reasons, primarily being what was already stated that our patients cannot speak for themselves. And though we all try to be the best Dr. Doolittles that we can be, we've not yet mastered animal language and the physical examination is critical and invaluable for providing us insight to the health of our patients, both large animals and small. Um, for many humans, the physical exam may not be important as important. In fact, I have been to a physician many times and never had an actual exam performed on me. And this is because I can explain what's wrong with me. I can have a conversation with my doctor, but I would never be able to see a patient and not actually perform a physical exam to, to diagnose or treat that animal, any animal. Um, animals can't verbalize where the pain lies and veterinarians really rely on silent clues to really unveil what's ailing patients. Um, and many animals, although domesticated, are still masters at hiding signs of illness or injury. And therefore, regular checkups and physical exams where we can palpate, auscultate, observe body language, and the behavior of our patients is critical to really revealing the true health status of any animal. Um, there are also unique and important aspects of the physical exam of individual species, such as gut sounds in horses, rumen contractions in cows or small ruminants, ambulation or flight in exotics. These are just a few examples. Um, these are things that veterinarians have had years of training to assess, and they really can't be assessed through telemedicine. Um, since COVID-19, our practice has utilized telemedicine for established clients, especially in an after hours situation where we can advise whether something needs to be seen immediately on an emergency basis or can possibly be brought in the next day. Our clients appreciate this additional form of communication and it helps prevent them from paying an emergency fee possibly if it doesn't have to come in and can wait until the next day. Ultimately though, this is only an adjunct to what we already do and does not replace the physical examination of our patients, which still needs to happen. Again, there are just things that veterinarians are trained to pick up on that owners can't accurately convey. Um, for large animal and rural clients, especially, the client-patient relationship goes even more beyond the physical exam 
to proper storage, handling, management of medications, quality assurance with medications, especially antibiotics and vaccines. We cannot use telemedicine to evaluate herd health, feed quality, animal handling, medication storage. The list is really endless. These are things that we need boots on the ground at a facility or ranch to evaluate in person to prevent misuse of medication in the food animal species, which is critical in ensuring a safe food supply and a high standard of animal welfare. Um, in summary, the valid client-patient relationship is critical in protecting our patients, and the cornerstone of that really is the veterinary physical exam. So we believe that telemedicine is a valuable tool, and we support this bill because it helps to give us a guideline in which to operate, which is currently missing. Um, in this fast-changing environment of, of medicine, we want to provide the best care while utilizing the newest and fanciest technology, but we want to make sure we don't do this to the detriment of our patients. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Morgan. And I believe next on the presentation is Dr. Costa. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Can everyone hear me? Yes, Dr. Costa, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate you guys. Hey, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna definitely say a lot of the same things that Dr. Morgan did. My name is Susie Costa, and I'm a native Nevadan as well. I really appreciate you guys being here today to listen to our comments about Assembly Bill 200. Um, our goal is to establish clear guidelines as well in Nevada for the use of telemedicine um, in the field of veterinary medicine. So I was the owner of Spencer Springs Animal Hospital in Las Vegas for about six years, and I'm currently the medical director of that hospital. Um, I built my practice on basic core values, trust, reliability, communication with our employees, communication with our, with our patients and clients, and a working relationship with the clients and hard work. And we try to do the absolute best in patient care here. So much has changed, as you guys know, over the past year with this with COVID-19. And it's really changed for veterinarians. And in our efforts to decrease the negative effects of COVID-19 virus in the lives of all of us by supporting social distancing and decreasing person-to-person -person contact, we've really tried, we've had we've increased our curbside service, we've increased our virtual visits and with telemedicine, thereby limiting the person-to-person -person contact uh, to ensure a safe environment. Um, I also feel that telemedicine, even before COVID, was trying to, it was becoming a more common phenomenon in human medicine. Uh, it's a way to make healthcare, healthcare more accessible and more convenient because that's what really everyone wants nowadays is convenience and, and accessibility. Um, there have been countless advertisements for new telemedicine software and programs to incorporate into our veterinary practices. And when, when these aren't regulated, uh, by a governing body that they really have the potential to harm both the consumers and their pets. Um, nothing can replace a physical exam, a thorough physical exam of our veterinary patients. It is the foundation of veterinary medicine. Without this, we accomplish nothing. We need to listen to our clients, tell us how the patient has been doing. We need to auscultate our patients. We need to listen to their heart and lungs for indications of illnesses. We need to look at our patients. We need to use our hands to evaluate their skin, their body, their joints, and their feet. We need to watch them breathe. We need to look at the color of their mucous membranes and make sure the insides of their ears are okay, make sure their teeth are okay, make sure their abdomen is okay. This is the basis of our veterinary client-patient relationship. Relationship. Communication between the veterinarian and the owner and the physical exam of the patient is really the cornerstone of what we do. And it's the cornerstone of building the proper telemedicine um, guidelines. Um, after the initial exam, the, the relationship has been established, but only after the veterinary client-patient relationship has been completed should it be possible for a telemedicine visit to be initiated. Questions about blood work, medication, progress, or declines in health can now be answered safely and effectively via video or phone. And please don't misunderstand me. There are great things about telemedicine. It allows us to help those who don't have access to transportation at the time or have limited funding, and, it's, and it helps eliminate the exposure for those with weakened immune systems. But is it a, it's a tool we need to incorporate into our practice 
only after we've established that relationship for follow-up visits um, and an initial practice in-person visit has been done by the veterinarian with the patient and the client. In my opinion, as a veterinarian, it is absolutely unsettling and unethical to diagnose it or treat via telemedicine a patient you've never touched or seen in person that a client or owned by a client that you've never met. Um, it's absolutely critical that we introduce veterinary telemedicine guidelines into Nevada's Veterinary Practice Act and give the authority to the Nevada State Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners to oversee telemedicine in Nevada. The implement implementation of these guidelines will help to ensure the highest level of protection for our patients, clients, and our veterinarians. So please, thank you for listening and please let's pass this bill. Costa. Um, Assemblymember Bill Bray Axelrod, are, can we move on to questions? That is it. Uh, we are okay. we stand for questions. Perfect. Um, members, please send me a message if you have any questions for our presenters. I am going to go to Assemblymember Flores to start us off. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair, and thank you, Assemblywoman, for your presentation. Uh, listen, Avor, thank you. Um, I'm just going back and forth between the amendment and the original text in the bill. So specifically in the original text, page two, section three, sub three, and then in the proposed amendment, page two, where it refers to section three. Um, I'm just trying, excuse me, page two and three. Uh, number one, the first question is, uh, is there a definition for when we when we're using the phrasing emergency or urgent care um is that do we have a definition for that um and or is that just customary of the industry where you have x y and z and it's it's up to the veterinarian to make that determination and then actually i'll leave it at that and then if madam chair gives me permission i'll continue but i first of all i want to understand that first I think I would turn this, Assemblywoman Shannon Bilber Axrod, for the record, I think that I would turn that over to uh, one of the veterinarians to answer that question. The record, Alyssa Naveworth, I, I believe that Dr. Pinnell, you could respond to that most accurately. If I understand the question, the, the question was. Uh, the definition of emergency or urgent care, again, for the record, Alyssa Naveworth. I, I believe that is defined, uh, but I, I don't have that right in front of me, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, for but the record, would... Assemblyman right. Flores, I believe it is defined in the larger practice act, and we can certainly follow up with that information for you. Okay. I can. Dr. Morgan, is that I you? Can... Uh, it Dr. May... Morgan, you would just identify yourself for the record, and then you can go ahead and answer. Uh, I'm Dr. Tessa Morgan. Um, it may kind of depend. I'm sure there is a, a definition in the Practice Act, but within our practice itself, um, urgent care and emergency can vary a little bit um, depending on the practice. For us, um, sometimes an urgent care is something that the client is needing a same-day appointment for, so a laceration or something that needs to be the sa seen the same day that they call um, versus something like a vaccine that could be scheduled you know, on a different day. Um, and that's kind of something that varies because not all practices see urgent or emergent cases. Um, it kind of depends on the individual practice. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, if I, if I may follow up. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and the only reason I asked this question is uh, when I had an opportunity to speak with the stakeholders, I very much understand the intent and understand that right now there is telemedicine happening and um, there is never that relationship uh, established in person with the animal itself and the veterinarian. And so the only thing I, and the reason I was asking about that is, uh, I'm always concerned that if that's the intent that we wanna establish that relationship, um, that the emergency or urgent can be defined in such a broad way that everything can be deemed to fall under that category and that we continue to, to have a scenario where there's folk who are just going strictly to the telemedicine and bypassing the requirement we're establishing now because they're saying, well, it is an emergency or it is urgent care. 
um, and and that we we still fall in the same place. But you may say you may say, well, that's impossible because X, Y, and Z. So that that's what I was trying to get at with that question. Um, by no means was I uh, trying to, to do anything else. Um, so maybe there there's a response to that. But if I could then follow up and and um, I see that in the amendment um, uh, on page one, section, excuse me, page one, uh, section two, we added or group of animals. And I just wanted to understand how that would work um, when we want to, uh, when we're talking about doing, uh, uh, having some type of electronic communication, when we're doing it with groups of animals, or in what scenarios would that apply? Um, how, how do we see that working out or it, I'm assuming there's a, a series of specific scenarios where you realize, wait a minute, we need to allow for telemedicine to occur with groups of animals. And I just, I, I was trying to understand it better. Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axrod. Um, actually, if I could go to Ms. Naveworth for the first part of uh, the clarification and then go to uh, one of the veterinarians for the second. Um, Thank you so much for again for the record, Alyssa Naveworth on behalf of the Nevada Veterinary Medical Association. As to your first question um, under that, we under, I understand the concern that we do not want people um, using the emergency care exception as a reason to bisect the veteran client patient, creation of the veteran client patient relationship. But I believe if you read the language in tandem with subsection two, it does allow that a veterinary may in good faith um, and without establishing the VCPR, provide emergency or urgent care. But in general, what this does say is that um, all of that care is now incorporated under the Practice Act and is subject and purview to the oversight and regulation of the Nevada Veterinary Board of Medical Examiners. And so uh, regardless of which it would not be the case if we did not pass AB 200. So what this does is it creates regulation and oversight where regulation and oversight do not currently exist. And we would defer to the leadership of the board to work through those issues about when someone abuses that that emergency care exception. Um, so that would be my first um, answer to your the first question. And as to the second, if I just might hazard, um, so that that's the first question. The groups of animals amendment, which would be the first amendment on section two, so the the number one on the conceptual. And um, I look to Dr. Pinnell um, to, to also speak to this, but um, we were very cognizant that we did not want to exclude the use of telemed veterinary telemedicine for um, agricultural and large rural practices. So what Dr. Morgan does, um, but others do in the state. And we felt like the amendment which adds or groups of animals would allow for the treatment of large herds um, uh, and larger ag agricultural practices. But Dr. Morgan and Dr. Pinnell, uh, someone Axarod, I don't know who you want to defer to. Um, I can give an example of how that would be used. So, for example, I have some uh, practitioners, some owners and clients that do uh, honeybees. And so when I go to treat their honeybees, I'm treating hives of thousands of bees at one time. And so they may call about a mite issue in that group of animals. And so it would be a group of bees. Or as another example, I have a client that has dairy goats and she has a herd of 35 dairy goats. And um, I you know, have a relationship with her where I've been to her operation. I know how she operates. I, I go out there at least twice a year, sometimes more if there's an issue, but I'm treating her, her entire herd of dairy goats uh, as a, a herd and a group of animals, if that clarifies. And, and Madam Vice Chair, I mean, excuse me, Madam Chair, if I could do one final follow-up. Yes, Mr. Flores, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The reason I, I was asking about this, I, is there a scenario, say, uh, I I sell puppies for a living, um, and I then indicate that my, you know, that th this group of puppies have all been seen by a veteran, by a, by a veterinarian 14 times, and, I, you know, I, I would assume that a buyer would care about that. I'm just curious to understand uh, if on the business side of it, um, you would still then, if you had... I don't know, a bunch of puppies in front of a camera, obviously that would never count as you doing anything. I'm assuming that in that scenario, you would want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about each animal. And, and that's what I was just trying to understand. If on the business side of it, 
something can be said that may be misleading through the business lens, not through a me taking care of all my animals lens. Now, I was just curious to understand that. Um, thank you, Assemblyman Flores, for the record. Um, Shannon Bill, Assemblywoman Shannon Bill Bray Axrod, I think that actually highlights once again what uh, Ms. Nave Worth uh, discussed about really the important, one of the biggest uh, important parts of this bill is, is allowing the Nevada Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners to see that. So if that came forward that someone was trying to have, you know, telemedicine look at a litter of puppies over and over and over again, calling it an emergency, that they currently do not have any oversight currently right now. So that would be just the end of it. But but for this bill, then they could come in and, and actually deal with that situation, which obviously should not be happening. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Thank you, Assemblymember Flores. I believe we have Vice Chair Carlton next. Thank you. Um, and I guess what I would like to understand is we have a lot of folks that live right on the border. So let's say I'm in um, a section of the state and it's really easier for me to see a vet in another state. Once I have that relationship with that vet in another state, would this law prohibit me from being able to do telemedicine visits with that particular veterinarian because myself and my animal are in the state of Nevada? Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbray, X Red for the record. I would defer to either uh, worth or legal for that. Thank you. That is a scenario, uh, again, for the record, Alyssa Naveworth, um, through you, Madam Chair, to um, Vice Chair Carlton. Uh, that is a scenario that we have not contemplated. I think that the answer, which means that we'll need to go back and get a precise answer for you, but the answer would be that it would be the intent. Like, so if they boarded in Arizona and the veterinarian was a licensed Arizona veterinarian, they'd be governed by the practice laws of, this, of Arizona because they're an Arizona licensee, but there also would be an intent that if someone is practicing telemedicine, from other borders and advising and taking care of Nevada pets that they should be captured and governed by the Nevada Board of Veteran Medical Examiners. And we probably need to contemplate that exact scenario for you. Well, and, and, and that's my concern because they're not, I mean, if the physical relationship that you're predicating the legislation on, if I drive the pet to wherever, let's use Arizona, I have that relationship but now as a snowbird or whatever, I go to another state, but I want to keep that relationship and contradictory. If I had a relationship with the veterinarian in Nevada, but yet I decide in July when it's 120, I'm taken off to Idaho, but I'd like to keep that relationship. I just want to understand how we work all those mm -hmm. things out. And if there's currently folks who have these relationships, is this legislation going to disrupt those le those relationships and make folks who've had a vet for a while that they've been working with have to go find a new veterinarian? So I just want to make sure we don't mm -hmm. um, have folks lose that person that they trust in, in working with it. So by adding that physical contact, once you've had that in-person visit, where does it go from there? So that's that's uh, what I'm trying to figure out. And uh, Assemblywoman Shannon Bilber Axrod for the question. That that's a that's an excellent uh, scenario. That I have to be honest, I didn't think of either because absolutely you could see down in Laughlin people going across the river. I'm sure that's where the majority of veterinarians. So, um, Miss Naveworth, if you want to say anything else, but we will definitely um, take that uh, into account and, and try to figure out the answer to that as soon as possible. Yes, um, again, through you, Madam Chair, to Vice Chair Carlton, uh, we will get a written answer for you, absolutely. That's, the scenario is not to eliminate uh, care, it's to, to ensure that we preserve the veterinary client-patient relationship while also giving jurisdiction of the board 
over those folks that are practicing telemedicine to make sure that they're compliant with not only the federal law associated with telemedicine, but to ensure that they're, they, it, should they be violating uh, the principles behind telemedicine, that they are accountable to the board. One thing I will say is that the BCPR, and I don't know if this fully answers your question, but I'll do more investigation, is currently already in regulation. So it's still it's currently required that you establish a timely veteran client patient relationship. It just is under the board of the regs of the Practice Act, and so that's being brought into the statute. I don't know if that's the beginning of the answer, but I will circle back with you absolutely with a, a more prepared written response. Do you members any other questions? Looking for hands raised. Okay. I have a comment, if that's okay, Dr. Costa. Okay, Dr. Costa, let me check to make sure there's, um, see if there's any questions for members and then before we go to back to you. Okay, uh, I actually have a quick question and um, Assembly Member Bill Bray Axelrod, is this, um, is there doctors right now practicing without that relationship? Or like, are they doctors from out of state seeing like Nevada um, animal patients or doctors within the state um, seeing um, animal patients via a, like telemedicine that haven't established that? Uh, BCPR, is that, is, that, is that an issue here? Is that a big issue? Assemblywoman Bill Brax read for the record. Well, I would say two things. One is um, we don't 100% know because we don't really have the teeth to, to go after. They shouldn't be because as um, assist, uh, um, Alyssa Nave Worth mentioned, it is in the regs, but um, I think it, it would really be hard to, to know since we don't really have the teeth um, to be the oversight. But uh, Ms. Naveworth, would you agree with that? Uh, yes, again, for the record, Alyssa Naveworth, that is correct. Telemedicine is not governed by the um, Nevada Board of Veteran Medical Examiners. In fact, the genesis of this legislation came through discussions that occurred during COVID-19 about adopting regulations um, regarding telemedicine, and it was decided that it was a that was a decision that should be made by the legislature, that should be the policy of the state of Nevada to say that we are going to allow telemedicine as a valid medical tool in the veterinary profession. That's a decision that the legislature makes and then gives the board the authority to act, enact the regulations to address the scenarios that have been raised by um, Vice Chair Carlton and Assemblyman Flores. Thank you. Okay, that was the only question I had. And members, any other questions? Okay, and Dr. Costa, I apologize. I just wanted to make sure we, we got all members' questions in before we came back. Um, Dr. Costa, you said you had some remarks you wanted to make? Yes, and for the record, it's Dr. Costa. And I just wanted to address uh, Vice Chair Carlton's concern. Um, I think that any veterinarian that you have, if you've previously um, had a relationship, a VCPR in, with your veterinarian in Idaho, um, you know, or in Las Vegas and you want to escape to Idaho for the summer, but you have a, a current VCPR with a, a veterinary in Nevada and you, and you had an issue or you had a question about medicine, um, you know, medicines your pet was taking or medicines that were needed, then they would be absolutely okay to, to give you that recommendation. I think if you presented um, with your veterinarian in Nevada while you were in Idaho during the summer and you presented that a situation where your pet was in need of something more serious, um, then that veterinarian would absolutely recommend you to somebody in Idaho. And I, I don't think that any of us would really feel comfortable um, giving you a diagnosis over the phone or, um, you know, with telemedicine. We would absolutely say you definitely need to go to a, a veterinarian in Idaho. So, I mean, the, the relationship is still absolutely established, but we would use that to give you a recommendation to see somebody very close to you. And I think that has to do with... Um, um, Assemblyman Flores's questions too, like the the emergency versus the urgent care. There's so many things that people think are emergency or urgent cares, um, but we always use our. We're, we're not going to give our diagnosis via telemedicine for an emergency. Uh, we're not going to give a diagnosis over the phone if we've never seen that pet. We will say, you know, please go to your nearest emergency center to get appropriate veterinary care. Same as an urgent care visit. I don't know if that helps or not, but those are those are the things I was thinking when you when you were both having questions. Thank you, Dr. Costa. Members, any other questions? 
Okay, seeing no further questions, we will move into testimony and support. Um, before we go into testimony and support, Mr. Secretary, I did want to note, could you please note that Assemblymember Tolls and Assemblymember O'Neill um, joined the meeting and they are with us. Okay, broadcasting, can we please check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 200? Yes, Chair. To testify in support of AB 200, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And again, to testify in support of AB 200, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 517, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 517. Yes, please. my name is Dick. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Danny Thompson, D-A-N-N-Y-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. I want to speak in favor of AB 200. You know, I don't think you can understate the importance of the veterinary client-patient relationship, uh, not only because animals can't speak and tell you where they hurt, but animals tend to hide injuries, you know, in the wild, an injured animal invites a predator and, you know, all animals come from the wild. And so they maintain that. But as a dog owner, and I have a bunch of them, I have a 11 year old wire haired German pointer named Cletus, who is a bird dog, and he will do anything to get in the swimming pool, uh, including hiding an ear infection that ended up with him having to have surgery on his ear. Uh, or he'll do anything to go to the desert to chase birds, including having a cactus sticking out of the side of his foot and just walking like there's nothing wrong. And so, you know, having that having that hands-on look by a vet, you know, who are trained to, you know, not only feel and, you know, touch the animal, but literally smell the animal, uh, It I, that can't be understated. And uh, I think it's a critical part of this bill that I, I wholeheartedly support and urge your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 613. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Hello, my name is Rebecca Goss, R-E-E-E-C-C-A, G as in girl, O, F as in Frank, F as in Frank, and I am testifying on behalf of the Nevada Humane Society in support of this bill. Um, it will help us better serve uh, the demands of our shelter medicine, specifically Section 4 regarding um, allowing the supervising veterinarian um, to have provision over the veterinary technician, even if they're not located in the same site as the shelter pets are our patients, we do have a client relationship already with them and it would allow our technicians to provide emergency after hour care as needed um, without having to have the veterinarian on site. So we would appreciate um, the passing of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goff. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of four, three, six. Oh, I apologize. Uh, the caller seemed to have hung up. Um, Chair, there are no more callers in support of AB 200 at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Next, we will hear testimony in opposition. Let's go to the phone line and see if there's anyone signed up to testify in opposition. Yes, Chair, to testify in opposition of AB 200, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for opposition at this time. 
Okay, can we check the phone line to see if there's anyone wishing to testify in the neutral position? To testify in neutral for AB 200, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 888, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jennifer Pedigo, P-E-D-I-G-O. I'm the executive director with the Nevada Board of Veterinary Medical Examiners. Examiners, I'd like to thank the chair and the committee um, for your time today. I'm testifying neutral today on AB 200 and I'd just like to convey my thanks to the bill's sponsor and the members that you've heard from today, um, thanking them for working with us on this language and um, being able to work and give feedback uh, regarding the conceptual amendment. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, broadcasting next caller. Chair, there are no more callers for neutral at this time. Okay, thank you. And Assembly Member Bill Bray Axelrod, would you like to give any closing remarks? Sorry about that, I couldn't unmute. No, thank you very much for your consideration and I will uh, we'll make sure to circle back with the two excellent um, questions that, that came up and thank you for consideration. Thank you, Assembly Member. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 200. Thank you, Assembly Member um, Bill Bray Axelrod and your presenters for being here with us. Okay, the next item on our agenda is Assembly Bill 227. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 227, which revises provisions relating to contractors. We have our own Vice Chair Carlton here to present the bill along with a few co-presenters. Vice Chair Carlton. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I will do a very brief I'll introduction. Our own Vice Chair Carlton here to present the bill along with a few co-presenters. Vice Chair Carlton. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And we seem to have an echo. I believe someone might be someone might have the television on who's presenting and be unmuted as well. So members, if you are not speaking, presenters, if you are not we speaking, have an echo. By yourself, um, someone might be someone might have the television. So Madam okay, Chair, I'm gonna start again. And it sounds as though the echo is gone. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, thank you very much for scheduling Assembly Bill 2. Again. Okay, one second. And it sounds as though the echo is gone. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, Vice Chair Carlton, let's try that one more time. It looks like we have everyone muted now. And I just want to make sure any presenters. Okay, Vice Chair Carlton, let's try that one more time. Mr. Stanley, I believe you're unmuted. If you could just mute yourself. Phil, it's your uh, turn to um, speak. Okay, Vice Chair Carlton, third time's the charm. Let's try this again. It looks like we have everyone muted now. Uh -huh. I love technology. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. So with that, I'm State Assemblywoman Maggie Carlton representing Assembly District 14. Uh, thank you again for scheduling AB 227 this afternoon. Um, 227 is an act you know, relating to contractors talking about the process of who may perform certain types of work for a contractor and revising the grounds for disciplinary action against a licensee by the State Contractors Board. Uh, the reason I bring this bill is this issue has uh, great importance to me because over the, the time that I have been here in the legislature, we've had a lot of discussions about lost wages, workers' comp, losses in revenue. So in order to be able to address some of the issues that I believe will be discussed by the presenters today, you know, I've, when I hear that hardworking Nevadans are, are losing wages, uh, in the scheme of how they're paid, it gives me concern. The fact that workers' compensation is not being paid appropriately and that we might possibly have workers get hurt and then not be able to access care gives me some concern. Um, and on the revenue side, 
Taxes are not on the honor system in this state. We expect everyone to pay their taxes and pay them appropriately. And if there's a way that folks are working and they're not being taken care of, I believe, it should be addressed. We've had this conversation about misclassification and independent contractors in this building for over a decade. And here's another issue that has been brought to light on how folks are being paid and the consequences to the state because of that. So with that, Madam Chair, um, I would be happy to turn over the presentation and the conversation around this issue to the folks who know it very, very well, to Mr. Bill Stanley, Ms. Newman from UCIC, and Dr. Wadups, um, who has the research paper that is referenced. So with that, Madam Chair, I'm happy to turn it over to my other presenters. Yes, Vice Chair Carlton, is there anyone in particular you would like to start with, Vice Chair? Uh, we'll go to Mr. Stanley first and then um, work our way through the list. Thank you very much. Perfect. Mr. Stanley, thank you for joining us today when you're ready. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Stanley first and then um, work our way through the list. Thank you very much. Mr. Perfect. Stanley, Mr. I don't think you might have us on in thank the background. Thank you for today when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman and members of the committee. Uh, as stated, I'm William Stanley, Secretary Treasurer of the Mr. Southern... Stanley, I don't think you might in the background? No, I'm the only one here. Are you watching the hearing as well or just joined by Zoom? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Madam Chair. When you're ready, Mr. Stanley. Are you watching the hearing as well or just joined by Zoom? I'm just joined by Zoom. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm just joined by Zoom. I'm the only one here. You're ready, Mr. Stanley. Thank you, Chairwoman and members of the committee. I am William Stanley, Secretary Treasurer of the Southern Nevada Building Trade Union. Assembly Bill 227 was in introduced by Assemblywoman Carlton, as we've heard, at the request of the Southern and Northern Nevada Building Trades Unions, along with other non-affiliated building trades you will, that you will hear from later, and the United Unified Construction Industry Council. We thank her for her leadership on these issues throughout her career in the Nevada legislature. We have worked with the stakeholders for the past two years and are seeking the passage of AB 227 to ensure the following, that only contractors are employees who are employed by the contractor on a project who perform the scope of work that requires a contractor's license. An employee of the contractor must be an employee who completes an IRS form W-4 and receives an IRS form W-2 from that contractor. The bill is that simple and straightforward. The reason this language is so important is for two reasons. First, recent court decisions have determined that for a contractor to be held responsible for the actions of those working under his direction, and I quote, they must either be him, herself, itself, or an employee of that contractor in the court case, Legacy Specialties D, case number CV20-00404 in department number 15, uploaded to Nellis for the committee's review, and I quote from the judge in the decision, this court concludes it is fundamentally unfair for the board to discipline a contractor for conduct that is widespread within the construction industry without notice of what is allowed and disallowed. This is particularly true when the board relies upon an uncertain statute and multiple private conversations with, quote, sitting legislatures, end quote, and others, and when there are no rules promulgated to guide the contractor and those who impose discipline. The inclusion of employee leasing companies within the definition of contractors may be a wise policy, but it should be codified by statute or promulgated by administrative rule so contractors can anticipate their affairs and adjust their business practices, end quote. We agree. Use of construction users of construction services, home builders, building owners, must have the protection of the contractor's board to ensure that those responsible for the construction project, including construction defects and the employer-employee relations, can be held accountable by the Nevada State Contractors Board. 
a public policy that was first codified in Nevada statutes in 1941. Secondly, misclassification of employees in the construction industry cost Nevadans millions of dollars in lost construction activity. When a contractor misclassifies an employee as either an independent contractor, a cash employee, or a leased employee, the employee is often made responsible for all payroll liabilities, both state and federally. Additionally, as it determined in a 2011 LCB employee misclassification study, bulletin number 1107 on page five, also uploaded to Nellis for the committee's use, misclassification of employees in the state of Nevada in 2011 cost Nevada's unemployment trust fund $8.2 million in lost revenue. Lost revenue to Nevada's workers' compensation fund and payments for the modified business tax are also underreporting. The Unified Construction Industry Council commissioned a study to review these issues within the construction industry in Nevada. So at this time, I'd like to turn the time over to Wendy Newman, Executive Director of UCIC, to discuss the council study after Ms. Newman and Dr. Waddups complete their testimony, who will be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. So at this time, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I would, if you so inclined, we would, uh, I would like to recognize um, Ms. Wendy Newman, Executive Director of UCIC, to discuss the study. Thank you, Mr. Stanley, and we got through it. Looks like the technical difficulties are behind us, so thank you for your patience with that. And Ms. Newman, when you're ready. Uh... Hello, thank Chairwoman you, and Dan Vice Dan Chair Lee. and members of the committee. Like the I'm Wendy Newman, Executive so Director of the Unified Construction that Industry that Council. Uh, the UCIC is a labor management cooperative committee composed of 14 affiliated skilled craft trade unions and over 200 contractors who employ the over 20,000 skilled trade workers. Our study, Payroll Fraud in Nevada's Construction Industry, Extent and Fiscal Impact, revealed that illegal labor practices by offending contractors took $90 million in economic activity out of Nevada's economy in 2018. Through the misclassification of employees and wage theft, these are just two ways offending contractors have illegally reduced their labor burden. And using data in 2018, the cost estimates suggest that these actions led to $31.1 million shortfall in the Nevada State Workers' Compensation Fund and $11.8 million loss in Nevada's unemployment insurance program and $6.6 .6 million in uncollected tax revenue via the modified business tax. The study contends that misclassification and off the books employment in the construction industry has likely cost taxpayers nearly $50 million annually. So at this time, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Jeffrey Waddups, the director of the Institute of, in I'm sorry, the Institute for Construction Economic Research and the chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He will provide you with a high level overview of the study and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Newman. And Dr. Waddups, thank you for being here with us when you're ready. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share some of the results of the study. Uh, I, have, I have something to share and I hope it works. So let's, let me try this. Uh, let's see, share screen. Are you seeing? Are you seeing the? Uh, are you seeing the screen that says testimony on AB two two seven? We are, Doctor Waddups. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. So the study uh, was conducted by three of us. I am uh, Jeff Waddups, the, an economist, and I'm on the board of directors of ICERIS, which is the Institute for Construction Economic Research. That's a nonprofit that supports high quality, nonpartisan <clears throat> research in the construction industry. I'm also on the faculty at UNLV, but I'm not speaking for UNLV today. 
my another co-author is Russ Ormiston. He happens to be president of ICERIS. And also Kevin Duncan, who is a research scholar for ICERIS and on the faculty at Colorado State University in Pueblo. So the study was, was titled Payroll Fraud in Nevada's Construction Industry, Extent and Fiscal Impact. And of course, we wanted to investigate the extent and fiscal cost associated with misclassification of construction workers. Now, misclassification, take, as, as has been alluded to, takes on three forms. Uh, it, it occurs when workers who meet the definition of an employee are misclassified as independent contractors. The second type occurs when workers who meet the definition of an employee are simply paid off the books. Uh, and a third type, which occurs when workers on public construction projects are misclassified from high skill categories to low skill, uh, and lo uh, not low skill, but low paying skill categories. Now we're not gonna really deal with this third type, it's, it's just the, the first and the second type. So let's move on. So how much do employers save by misclassifying? Uh, we we uh, looked at this question and we, we found that total employment costs of a legal worker for a construction, for a, a, a contractor in the construction industry, averaged about $47,486. Uh, total employment costs of a misclassified worker, you kind of did a range on this, was between $34,000 and $40,000. So there are definitely uh, differences. And of course, the, the consequence here is an unlevel playing field and a competitive disadvantage for law-abiding employers. All right. So the question is, how did we how did we measure the amount of misclassification? Well, it turns out that in the literature there there's this method that that people have come up with to try to measure this. So this is what we do: we compare what workers report about their employment to the government surveyors, say through the American Community Survey, with what employers report about their payrolls. So the difference between what workers report and what employers report represents workers who report being employed in the construction industry but don't show up on payrolls. So it's a nice way to, to get at who is being misclassified. Okay, uh, based on data from 2018, we found that about one, 111,000 workers reported that they worked in the construction industry in Nevada. While the, the uh, and that only 91,000 workers were on construction contractors payrolls. So the difference is roughly 20,000. It represents an estimate of independent contractors and off the books workers in the industry. Now, we estimated that about 64% of these workers were illegally misclassified based on this study that was done by the IRS in 2016. Okay, so how much does Nevada lose per misclassified worker? Well, per worker, uh, we would find, we would, our estimates showed that uh, a, typical con a, a typical employee would have $927 paid to, into uh, the, the UI system on his or her behalf. Workers' compensation insurance figures uh, $2,445, modified business taxes $518. And this is per worker. So in total, the amount of revenue that, that is, is, is lost by the state is roughly $4,000. Now, then what we did is we multiplied those per worker figures by 12,717 workers. And that's how we got our $49.5 million hit that the state of Nevada takes. Now, of course, the consequence here is an underfunded safety net and through the modified business tax, revenue losses to the state. Okay. So our, con our study is consistent with other research around the country on employee misclassification construction. I've listed some, some places there that where studies have been done. We estimate that you know roughly 12,717 construction workers were misclassified 
and each misclassified worker cost the state roughly 4000 and the total yearly cost of the state is 49.5 million. So that's a broad overview of the study and I'm willing to take questions if, uh, if they come up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wadups. Vice Chair Carlton, should, are we ready to open it up for questions? Or uh, yes, Madam Chair, happy to uh, have committee members ask the presenters questions. Um, I had asked them to be very brief, knowing our workload. Um, the study, the court case, all the documents are there. Uh, I think it's very telling that even based on 2018, and we knew 2019 was a better year than 18, that it was $50 million. We can only extrapolate what it might have been in 19. I will say that one of the issues that has, um, has come to light um, in my nonprofit daytime job are folks that thought they were going to have unemployment insurance because they were getting a paycheck, they thought they were being paid, they went to apply for unemployment and found out they weren't getting it because they weren't that type of employee. So I, I think there's another issue that has arisen outside of all this. Um, we need to make sure folks are ed educated when they work in this scheme so that they know there might not be that. But the fact that um, that this is happening in the construction industry, you know, our three major industries, mining, hospitality, and construction. If we've got this problem in one of our major industries in this state, it's going to cause a divot in our budget. It's gonna hurt working Nevadans, and we can't necessarily make sure that they'll get the medic medical care that they need if they do get hurt on the job. So with that, uh, be happy to turn it over to my presenters to answer any of the very good questions I know will be coming from the committee. Thank you, Vice Chair Carlton. Um, I'm gonna start with Assembly Member Tolls. Thank you so much, Chair, and, and thank you, Vice Chair Carlton, for bringing this forward, and thanks to the presenters, too. I really, I, I, I do appreciate the explanation as to the purpose of this bill and, and really trying to um, address the, you know, the sort of the under-the-table, off-of-the-grid um, contractor who's not paying taxes. That hurts um, our revenue in our state, and then certainly the disciplinary aspect of being able to follow up. Um, I won't go into personal stories, but I can definitely appreciate uh, the value of that. We've heard a lot of feedback from the specifically in section one, subsection two, uh, just the classification that uh, we're removing the ability, essentially, as I read it, um, for an employment agency to utilize um, the services of both skilled and unskilled um, workers. And so I know that they, they play a different role under the labor commissioner being able to provide um, flexible work um, and currently on projects, smaller projects and so forth. So could you just speak a little bit to those concerns that were raised that um, we're removing the ability for a licensed um, skilled worker to operate under an employment agency? Chairman, uh, Bill Stanley for the record. I, I don't know what's going on. I, I've got a delay of about 10 seconds between what's being said and what I'm hearing. I, I don't know. I'm not so sure what, what's going on here, but uh, I will try to answer uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, to assuming one toll. Um, what, I wanna make sure that we understand what we're talking about when we talk about skilled and unskilled. Currently, in Nevada's law under NRS 624 in the construction industry, individuals that perform job site cleanup, for instance, are, are folks who come in to clean the windows and do the end of the job and get it uh, tidied up for uh, the end user to take over um, the building. Um, those services do not currently require a contractor's license. And so when we were working with stakeholders over the last two years, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were clear 
that those individuals who do that work that currently don't require a contractor's license, that we weren't trying to expand the role of the contractor's board. So that language that you see there, it, I don't want people to think that we're talking about those folks who may be doing construction work or call skill. If you're doing construction work that requires a con contract applies to you, but we weren't trying to capture people who were not already required to be um, uh, required to have a contractor's license. So that's what we were trying to address there. Um, uh, next, uh, we really are trying to get to the root of this that came up in court where by uh, the contractor's board was told that if a contract it, or if an ent entity is not licensed as a contractor, even though they're on a job site performing construction work, if the contractor's board tries to discipline them through means that I've been familiar with for the 50 years I've been in the construction industry, um, 45 years I've been in the construction industry, I don't want to exaggerate. Um, uh, we're told that they couldn't discipline that contract because he was not a contractor. And so, and we take the judge at his word when the judge said, look, the statutes aren't clear. You need to go back to the legislature and clarify the statute. And that's what we're doing. And working with the state contractors board and others, uh, we've tried to do that in, in section um, in in, um, in section three, of paragraph seven, where we've tried to clear up what exactly the judge said when we included the language that says um, a license by which that person either directly or through a person employed by that person agrees to perform the work. In addition to any disciplinary or other action that may be taken against the licensee, licensee pursuant to this subsection and any of this subject is void and unenforceable. So that if a contractor on a construction site hires someone that is not licensed to Nevada, that contract is void and therefore we can hold the contractor who brought them to the job site, Lyle case in, in, in Tahoe, where this come out of, of a contractor for any other purpose out of the state did not pay his employees. Uh, there were um, complaints filed with the labor commissioner. There were complaints obviously filed with the contractor's board. Uh, the contractor appealed uh, a, a court decision, went to the appellate court, and it was overturned. And, said, and, and the language was that, look, if they're not a contractor, you don't have the statutory authority to discipline them. We think that's wrong. We think that's a bad decision and we're here to fix it because we believe the end users of construction ought to be protected and, and, and it has been the public policy in this state. One, that contractors in the state of Nevada are licensed and they're disciplined when they do something uh, that isn't contrary, that's not contrary to public policy. And in this case, clearly this contractor out of Texas did something that was egregious didn't pay his employees uh, and, and other work at the job site that wasn't completed correctly. And, um, um, you know, that those people need to be held accountable for that. And that's what we're trying to fix here. So that's the two issues we're trying to get at. One is make sure we can hold bad contractors, you know, accountable at the contractors. And secondly, to make sure contractors who aren't playing by the rules and paying fair wages and benefits and, and, and their taxes and, and laying that burden at the feet of their employees unknowingly in some cases um, can be held accountable with, with the uh, state's labor commissioner. So I hope question Assemblywoman, Assemblywoman told, but uh, you know, that's, that's my understanding. And that's, that's what we're trying to get at here. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. May I ask a follow-up? I apologize. I was on mute. My guest, please. Thank you so much, and um, I, I appreciate and I, and I agree. I, I that, that scenario is is um, you know awful, and we we should in this body fight um, against that. And so I, I do mean it when I say I appreciate the the value of this legislation. Um, I do want to note though that this um, looking at and I appreciate the the court case study, that that was a, a contractor that was not a private employment agency. So do we have, we do have a way to also discipline um, skilled and unskilled workers under a private employment agency through the labor commissioner. 
I just want to clarify that. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to, to Assemblywoman Tolls. Um, in fact, as I understand it, well, I, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on daytime television, so I, I want to be clear here, okay? So uh, uh, I'm parroting here, and so I get myself in trouble when I do that. But uh, my understanding is that this entity out of Texas was acting as a leasing agency, or at least that was the claim. They were acting as a leasing agency to the contractor in Tahoe. Um, there is, was as, as you read the case, there is some testimony uh, to that validity, but at least that was some of the excuses that were given. So uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not disputing the value of uh, leasing agencies, uh, employee leasing agencies. What I am uh, challenging is for a contractor uh, or for an entity to be held liable for work that employees of that entity does on a construction site, they have to be a contractor. And the employee leasing company is the, is the employer of record, not the contractor. So the contractor simply says, well, they're not my employees. So if they did that, I'm not liable for it. Go see the employee leasing agency. And the employee leasing agency says, I'm not liable, I'm not a contractor. So we can't keep paying past the buck. And so the way that the group of us who come together over the last two years determine the best way to fix this problem is just make everybody an employee of a contractor. You have to be a W-4, W-2 employee of the contractor. It fixes all these issues. It fixes the issue with the misclassification. It fixes the issue with the underpayment of workers. Where leasing agents can pay a lower uh, uh, workers' comp rate and a different unemployment rate than different contractors that are employing the people at the job site. One, two, it makes sure that we can hold the entity who performed the work. In this case, it's the leasing agency who's not liable for the work that those employees that are their employee performed at the site of the work and not the contractor. So, it, it's convoluted. I, I can tell you, I've been in the business a long time. When I read this case, it, it's, it stood me on my head. I was like, this is against everything I've always understood. And, and by the way, I've been a licensed contractor myself. Uh, it's not what I understood, um, the contracting relationship with the uh, construction user. Um, but that's what came out of the courts, and we're here to fix it because it's, it's not good public policy. Thank you for your answers and, and for your passion. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I, I do want to note on page two that Legacy was a contracted license, uh, contractor licensed in the state of Nevada, but maybe I missed somewhere else that it was a, acted as a private employment agency. But thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the explanations, and, and I do appreciate what you're getting at with this bill. I, 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 I do. Thank you, Assembly Member Tolls. Next, we have questions from Assembly Member Kasama. Thank you so much, Chair. And, and if I may, I have uh, two questions. This is Assemblywoman Heidi Kasama, District 2. So my first question is, in the presentation of the lost revenues to the state, um, it would seem to me that to have that be a correct number, we would also have to have an estimate of the payouts that weren't made. So that now we're including revenues for employees that are properly classified. And then from a historical perspective or, or from averages, we'd have to see how many of those employees get paid out workman's comp or unemployment insurance and deduct that to have a true net effect to the state. Because for example, right now during the COVID, we're, we're losing money. The revenue is not coming in enough to, to cover the unemployment. So. Um, and I can't remember the gentleman that gave that presentation, but it seems to me that we're missing the estimated payouts as well to get to a net revenue number. Would that be correct? I believe that might have been for Dr. Waddups. 
Assemblymember Kassam, we'll go to him first. Yeah, okay. To you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Kassam, I would ask. I think that might have been for Dr. Wadaf. Yes, I was going to say Dr. Wadaf is going to answer that question. Okay. All right. Can everyone hear me? I'm... Okay. Through you, uh, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Kasama. Uh, okay, so what we did is, is we just made broad estimates of how much money would not be provided to the state uh, to the state fund for unemployment insurance or workers' compensation if, uh, or, or given that, uh, given that workers were treated as illegal independent contractors that were just paid as cash employees. So we didn't have any way to estimate payouts. Uh, we just, what, what we estimated was that or what, what we found is that these funds would be underfunded by a certain amount given that behavior. And, and that's all we could do uh, with this study. I understand. It, it just seems like you can also come up with an estimated amount of payouts based on how many employees in the state, how many people get payouts. It, anyway, so that's just, just a, a comment that I'm making on that. And then um, my other question is in the language on page two of what I'm looking at. So that'd be section one, um, section one, subsection, I guess, 1.1B, where it says by or through an employee or employees of the contractor or of another contractor in that section B. So what, what I'm trying to understand, I understand the mis classification of employees and employers not trying to pay their fair share. And I, I completely agree with that um, statement. But for example, if I hire a contractor to remodel my house and he hires out an electrician and he's a contractor and he hires an electrician who's a contractor to do that work, then that, that electrical contractor would be paid with a 1099. He wouldn't be a W-2 employee. So I don't understand how that's being taken into account here. I don't know who can answer that question, but it, it seems to me that you hire yourself. Yeah, that, that's, not, that's not my bailiwick, so. Madam Chair. Um, I don't know who can answer that question, but it, it seems to me that you hire yourself. Yeah, that, that's, not, that's not my bailiwick, so. So, Madam Chair, Bill Stanley, for the record. Uh, uh, let me, I can answer that. So, um, to answer the, um, through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Kasama. So, in the, case that you, in the situation, the case that you just laid out, the hypothetical that you just laid out, in that case, you hire a general contractor to do some work on your home. Uh, that general contractor hires an electrician. Uh, that subcontractor, that electrician, that person that holds that specialty license also has to be licensed through the state contractors board. Uh, a contractor cannot hire, knowingly or unknowingly, hire an individual who is not a licensed contractor. So in the case that you described, both the general contractor that you hired and the electrician would ha both have to be contractor. One would be the general contractor or the prime, and the other one would be a subcontractor to the general contractor. But in that case, the prime contractor, the general contractor that you hired, would be responsible for everything on the job site, including uh, the work of the electrical contractor that they perform for you, the homeowner. Uh, the liabilities, um, payroll liabilities, rest with the general contractor, the prime contractor, if the subcontractor did not pay their employees. What's different in the case that we're trying to resolve here is that a prime contractor in the hypothetical that you described hires an electrical contractor who's not a who's not a contractor licensed in the state of Nevada and doesn't pay his employees and that contractor wires your house wrong and the prime contractor says not my fault go see them and and the electrician says well I'm not a contractor you can't do anything to me uh, and, and and that's really what we're trying to get at here we're going to make sure that that prime contractor who hired 
the electrician who was a property license can he can be held liable for that. And so we're really trying to get to that basic point to protect you, the homeowner, in that case, so that you have uh, a, a way of uh, resolving your issue, which is you got a house that's not wired correctly now. And so, um, and and that's really the bottom line here, so that you know consumers are um, and end users of construction services are protected as we've always believed they were through the state contract report. Thank you. I believe that um, really helps. So long as you're hiring another licensed contractor, you don't have to make them an employee. So it's for these people that are not licensed. So thank you very much for that explanation. I think I understand that now. Thank you, Assembly Member Kasama. Next, we will go to Assembly Member Dickman. And uh, Mr. Stanley, I will pause um, so the members know because you, there is a delay. I will pause and give Mr. Stanley time for his delay to take place and then answer the question. And then, and Mr. Stanley as well, you can go directly to the members, please. The so next up, we have Assembly Member Dickman. Thank you so much, Chair Howdy. Um so it, it almost seems like this bill basically eliminates private employment agencies. And if that is true, how does it affect, say, for example, young workers who might be new to construction and want to try different trades in a temporary setting or to decide which trade they might want to focus on or what company they'd want to work for? Or, or maybe contractors who um, need to temporarily increase their staff to complete projects. How would this affect them? So uh, to you, Assemblywoman Dickman, um, to answer your, your question, um, I'm not trying to work I don't think uh, anyone trying to dictate uh, that relationship between um, a contractor and a source of employment or employee, a source for employees. All we're saying is that when those employees come to your job site, they have to be on your payroll. They can't remain on the temporary employment agency's payroll. That may be a shift in a business model for some people. Uh, but this has all been brought on by a court case uh, that we all didn't anticipate. And so uh, there may be a change in people's business practices, um, but we believe that, uh, that uh, having uh, the employee become the employee of the contract construction industry, we have here in Southern Nevada, we have on a temporary basis, for instance, at the convention center, who go out and do construction, well, pre-COVID, I should say, who regularly went out there and they would take on a temporary basis for one or two days. Uh, and, and they were always on the contractor's payroll and they returned, uh, you know, to the, and I was regularly done in the construction industry. I know that there are, um, there are employment agents dispatch uh, skilled crafts workers to non-union workers, and those individuals uh, are immediately placed on the contract payroll for the temporary time that they're there, and then in their return, they return back to a temporary hiring agency uh, for for the next job. Um, they're affected by that. We openly admit this, but we believe it's such. Such a, a minor change or a relationship with the temporary hiring uh, agency um, that, uh, uh, given the arching uh, interest in the public policy that is enshrined in the uh, enforcement of the contract report NRS 624 in the state of Nevada, we believe that that's not onerous. It will um, change in their business practices, could facilitate and continue that. A practice of, of dispatching and employing uh, crafts workers uh, for all of those that need. 
Thank you. I, I missed an awful lot of that. You were kind of cutting out, but but I think I got the gist. So thank you. I apologize. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, thank you, Assemblymember Dickman, for your question. Next, we will go to Assemblymember O'Neill. I have to get the unmute button working. Assemblymember O'Neill, we can't hear you. You want to try again? Chair, this is Michael from Broadcast. If you'd like me to, I can walk him through connecting with his phone if you want to try that. Assemblymember O'Neill, would you like to connect with your phone? Okay, Assemblyman O'Neill, if you click the little carrot, the little arrow next to the mute button, a menu will pop up. And on the menu, in the third box down, there's a switch to phone audio. If you click that, it will give you a phone number. And then if you follow the prompts, it should connect via your phone. So you'll still be on screen with us like normal, but you'll be able to use your phone audio. And sure, this may take a minute or two for him to go through the steps. It shouldn't take too long, but. Okay, perfect. We'll wait for him to connect on audio. Members, let's just we'll stand at ease until Assemblymember O'Neill can connect via telephone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Member O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. This is embarrassing, and I, I greatly appreciate it. I've had nothing but computer problems today, it seems. Um, now i got to remember my question. Um, to Mr. Stanley, I'm, I'm confused in the sense that it's, the state requires the state contracts with uh, numerous people and as uh, consultants, assistants, particularly in Division of Child and Family Services, and it goes through manpower, and they require that they have a certain level of manpower before they can supply the employee, have a uh, insurance. To, uh, for any malpractice or work, and also make sure that they take care of their unemployment, uh, et cetera. Uh, so I'm at a loss. Can't the contractor, who may only need a unskilled laborer to muck out or clean out a residence, a building, for a day or two, in their contract with that private employment agency, re make the same requirements that they have to provide these uh, services uh, to ensure that the employee who they're hiring through the PIA is protected, covered uh, with unemployment insurance, workers' comp, et cetera, and that they're protected also? That's a long question, I know, but I'm really confused here, and I need your help. Oh, uh, to you, Assemblyman O'Neill, I'm as frustrated today with this tech 
technology as you are. So I uh, I appreciate where we're all here today. To try to answer your question, in, in the scenario, in the hypothetical that you just laid out, uh, that temper that would have uh, sent someone to a contractor to clean out a house would not be required to be a licensed contractor. Therefore, that situation would not be precluded. And that's not what we're trying to fix. In fact, if you go back to the language that I discussed, which uh, earlier um, in um, section one, uh, subsection two, I mean, uh, subparagraph two, um, you know, that is what we're saying there is that a contractor, um, we're not trying to include work that the contractor already have jurisdiction over. So those types of individuals that you're talking about that do cleanup, those individuals that come in and do, you know, the, the, the cleanup of the building when we're done, vacuuming, cleaning windows, and doing all that final readiness for the building or in the beginning of the building, uh, uh, you know, for um, in the beginning of the construction, getting the construction site ready to go, those individuals are currently not governed and don't require a contractor's license. So we're not trying to gather those folks up because we currently, the state contract report doesn't currently have jurisdiction over that work. But if I may, Chair, just follow up, please. Yes, Mr. O'Neill. The delay is murder on this procedure. Mr. Stanley doesn't, usually the contractor, part of their contract is to deliver the finished product. So technically the contractor is providing the service of cleaning. And I'm just using that as an example, even if they have an unskilled laborer to carry the bricks, um, my steps on. That's how he started in the construction business as a, and now as a contractor. He started working as a teenager packing bricks uh, up to the bricklayers, stonemasons, etc. to learn the trade. So that's, I'm just saying, it just seems to me it's still part of the contractor's work that, and they could negotiate, have their contract, have a contract with those private employment agencies to provide, ensure that the employees they hire or give to them supply are covered under the various um, insurance bills, workers comp, et cetera. That's all. Thank you. Okay, Madam Chair, I'm not. I'm not sure that somebody went. There's something that was looking for a response there. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you. Was I, I was in the sense of expanding. It's just the contractor still providing a service of cleaning up. That's part of their requirement. So. I'm just, I'm still confused, and maybe it is in response from him. I would probably beat on this horse a little too much today. So thank you. That's it, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, if I could just hop in to, to, to reiterate, oh, reiterate. Those, those, those folks are not licensed yeah. and not under the jurisdiction of the contractor's board. So therefore this would not comply. This would not, they would not comply with this. So that's why the language was put in to make sure that we didn't adversely affect someone who really uh, the contractor's board has no jurisdiction over. So we just wanted to make sure that folks who are supposed to be licensed contractors who need to be held accountable on the job site can be held accountable, but we don't wanna go after folks that we don't need to. Thank you, Madam. Vice Chair Carlton. Okay, members of the committee, um, any further questions? Okay, I just want to make a quick statement, not so much a question, but say thank you. This was actually an area or um, an issue which. Okay, I just want to make a quick statement, not so much a question, but say thank you. This is an area where.
Okay, <laughs> here we go again. I just wanted to say thank you so much for bringing this. I remember I carried a wage theft bill in 2017, and because misclassification was such a big issue, and we, we, that we're still dealing with. And I remember specifically testimony from Mr. Jim Halsey, um, representing IBEW, about his members and about how over the course from 2002 to then they had hired a compliance officer to help over 300 of their members who had been misclassified. Um, collect over a million dollars in wages that were due to them. So I just wanted to say thank you for bringing the bill forward, Vice Chair Carlton. And with that, seeing no further questions, we can go to the telephone line for those who are wishing to testify in support. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone line? Yes, Chair, to testify in support of AB 227, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 184, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Yep, this is uh, Jeffrey Prophet. I am the business manager of Sheet Metal Local 88 here in Las Vegas, and I also represent over 2,000 sheet metal workers throughout the state of Nevada. <clears throat> I want to thank uh, Vice Chair Carlton for bringing this bill forward. This has obviously been uh, an ongoing problem in the state of Nevada year after year. Uh, we believe we are in favor of this. We believe this levels the playing field, it stops rewarding unethical contractors. And then uh, number two, it stops the exploitation of hardworking employees across the state. So again, we are uh, in full favor of this and we thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. Thank you. And broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 062. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This is Brandon Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S, representing Carpenters Local 1977, representing 6,000 members in the state of, uh, or pardon me, just in Las Vegas, Southern uh, Nevada. Uh, we are definitely in support of this. This is definitely a way that we can uh, help control the rash of, you know, labor abuse and the misclassification. Uh, so it helps bring dignity and value to the workers of the state. We are all for it. We are definitely in favor of it. We appreciate this being brought forward by uh, Assemblywoman Connor Carlton. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 056. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chairman Howdegy and members of the committee. My name is James Halsey, J-A-M-E-S-H-A-L-S-E-Y, and I am the business manager of IBW Local 357. Today I speak in favor of AB 227 on behalf of our 4,000 members that work every day as employees and receive a W-2 every year. We support this bill to ensure that all workers in construction have the same employment protections that W-2 employees of a contractor are afforded. Those protections include unemployment insurance, future social security benefits, and workman's comp. Again, that is why we are in support of this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Halsey, for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 764. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and members. My name is Mike West, M-I-K-E-W-E-S-T. <clears throat> I represent the International Union of Painters and Alli Allied Trades. The rampant misclassification of people as independent contractors doing the work of licensed contractors is a huge problem in Nevada for the IUPAT, and that includes painting, drywall finishing, floor covering, and glazing. We stand in solidarity with the Northern and Southern Nevada building trades 
in support of AB 227, and I'd like to thank Bill Stanley for doing an excellent job in representing us all. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I'm broadcasting next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 796, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, member of the committee. Rusty McAllister, R-U-S-T-Y, M-C-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-R, the Executive Secretary Treasurer for the Nevada State AFL-CIO, representing over 150,000 workers here in the state of Nevada. Uh, I'd like to thank Assemblywoman Carlton for bringing forth this bill. Uh, it's a very important bill. Uh, uh, all of you who have read this court case now that's brought up in the uh, documentation of this bill can see that it allows for a passing of the buck, and this bill would help to close that loophole so that we can no longer pass the buck on who's responsible for uh, taking care of workers. Um, currently in the state of Nevada, uh, a, a large number of our workers are being exploited. As you've heard in testimony uh, and read through this case, uh, workers not being paid. Uh, it's not the first time, and it probably won't be the last until we can get some things fixed. So. This will help get rid of uh, or help those exploited workers. Not only that, the other people who are exploited here are the residents of the state of Nevada who happen to pay the taxes and pay the uh, workers' compensation uh, for companies or for employees that are not covered by workers' comp through these uh, various work arrangements that are done in the state. Uh, this will help close that loophole, too. Uh, I hearing the number of $90 million a year that the state of Nevada is essentially leaving on the table by allowing this to continue to occur uh, is not a good practice at a time when we're uh, uh, always looking for more revenue to fund important priorities in, including, in the state, including education. Leaving $90 million on the table is not good uh, policy. Uh, so with that, Madam Chair, members of the committee, we stand in support of this bill. We think it's long overdue and will help address these issues going forward. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. McAllister. Um, broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 692, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, this is Don Campbell with the National Southern Nevada Chapter of the National Electrical Contractors Association, otherwise known as NECA. That's D, Don, D-O-N, Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. NECA stands as an association of contractors in support of this bill, AB 227, because of the illegal labor practices in the construction industry that truly do result in payroll fraud, the law-abiding employers, such as our members, end up paying, as Dr. Wadups indicated, between 18 and 38 percent more per worker than contractors who engage in payroll fraud. Without these kinds of protections that AB 227 affords, Misclassification runs rampant in the construction industry and creates an uneven, uneven playing field in which rule-breaking contractors are rewarded at the expense of law-abiding contractors and particularly of their employees and the public. We absolutely support the passage of AB 227 and hope to have your support and thank the chair for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 681. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hi, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Vincent Saavedra, B I N C E N T. S-A-A-V-E-D-R-A -A -E with the District Council of Ironworkers. Uh, users of the construction projects are at risk 
and the risk of injury on the construction job sites is higher when construction workers are completing tasks they are not qualified to perform. We support this legislation as it protects both contractors and his or her employees. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Saavedra. Broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 517. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Danny Thompson. That's D-A-N-N-Y Thompson, T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. I'm here today representing IBW 1245 and IBW 396. We support this bill for all the reasons that have been stated, you know, in Nevada, when someone is being paid under the table in the construction industry and other industries, and there's an accident, which inevitably there is, uh, you know, that person then is paid or their claim is paid out of the uninsured fund, which every employer pays into in the state of Nevada. And I will tell you in the past, there have been some horrific accidents that literally uh, near a million dollars. Uh, and so, I think it's important that uh, that this bill pass and correct this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson, for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller, please. If you recently joined the call and would like to testify in support of AB 227, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 203, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about this bill. My name is Matthew Wynn, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-N-G-U-Y-E-N. I'm the man business manager of People Ready in Las Vegas. People Ready provides general and skilled tradespeople to companies in a wide variety of industries, including approximately 100 workers per day to construction contractors in the state. If this bill passes the way it was originally written, those workers will lose their jobs. I believe you're calling in opposition of the bill. We're still in the supportive um, category. So Sorry. if you just want to um, self back into queue, and then we will call all you once we get into the opposition portion of the bill hearing. Thank you. Broadcasting, next caller, please. If you recently joined the call and would like to testify in support of AB 227, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, we are currently on support. Caller with the last three digits of 142, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, through Madam Chair, Maggie Carlton, my name is Alfonso Lopez, A-L-F-O-N-S-O-L-O-P-E-Z of Smart Local 88. I speak in full support of AB 27 to help filter out the bad, irresponsible contractors that come do work in our state. Again, thank you all for your time in hearing this matter, um, an issue that will definitely increase revenue to our state. That is all. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, broadcasting, next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 534, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Yeah, this is uh, Richard Daly, R-I-C-H-A-R-D-D-A-L-Y. Uh, representing the Labor Union Local 169 in Northern Nevada, uh, speaking in support of uh, uh, SB, to AB, excuse me, AB 227. Uh, and uh, for the reasons that were stated uh, by Mr. Stanley and others, and, and I work with him on uh, some of this language to try to make sure we address the issue that came out of the court case regarding the contractors board and their jurisdiction. So I think this is an important step in the right direction to remedy uh, that particular situation. And there seemed to be some, hopefully can clear up some questions that the committee had uh, regarding 
what is and isn't covered. There are a variety of scopes of work that the contractor's board requires a contractor to have a contractor's license in order to perform. There are other scopes of work that uh, are commonly performed on construction sites, uh, at least some of them, and don't require a contractor's license. So that's the bifurcation there. Uh, the work that Mr. Uh, O'Neill spoke about is a HOD carrier, that's HOD carrier, servicing a bricklayer. That is work that would be covered and required uh, a contractor's license in order for that person to perform. Other types of work, for instance, uh, flagging, not covered. They're not really building anything. They're commonly on construction jobs, but it doesn't require a contractor's license to perform that work. So that's kind of a distinction on what is and isn't covered. Uh, so whenever a contractor is performing work that requires a license, that person needs to be on the payroll of the contractor. So the contractor's board has jurisdiction to make sure um, there's accountability, both to the consumer who's hiring that contractor, the prime contractor, the subcontractor, and everybody involved. And I think that's the neck or the genesis of this uh, bill. This is a step in that direction uh, to solve that problem, and I believe that it will. And I urge your support all the way across the board, and I hope uh, uh, the explanation was helpful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Daly, for your testimony. I'm broadcasting next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 292, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Rob Benner, R-O-B-B-E-N-N-E-R with the Northern Nevada Building Trades. We believe this legislation will help the contractors board enforce the contracting laws in Nevada the way they should be enforced. Too many, contract, too many construction workers in Nevada are taken advantage of. This bill would help prevent that kind of abuse. Uh, we are in support of AB 227. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 126. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman. My name is Robert Conway, Ironworkers Local 433, representing 5,000 workers. Uh, when contractors engage in unethical practices to boost their profits, these actions come at a considerable cost to the state, which has been described pretty good this afternoon. Um, any support we can get, and we urge to AB 227 is appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Okay, thank you. Now we will move into testimony in opposition. Can we check a telephone line broadcasting for testimony in opposition? Yes, Chair. To testify in opposition of AB 227, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 079, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. This is Josh Hicks. I'm an attorney with McDonald Crono and I am representing the American Staffing Association today in opposition to this bill and particularly with respect to the impact this bill will have um, on private employment agencies. Uh, private employment agencies are members of ASA. They provide temporary labor uh, in a variety of industries throughout the state. There's around 30,000 Nevadans um, who work for PEAs and industrial con uh, contexts, commercial contexts and construction contexts. It's important to note that a PEA is a licensed and regulated entity in the state of Nevada. They are licensed and regulated by the labor commissioner. The employees of a PEA are W-2 employees. The workers' comp is paid on them. UI is paid. 
MBT gets paid, income taxes are withheld. Uh, and I think it's important to note that because one of the stated, I mean, really the stated purpose for this bill is to avoid cash under the table um, or independent contractor type situations. That is not the type of situation you will see with a PEA um, for all the reasons that I just set forth. There are thousands of PEA um, employees, Nevadans, who work in construction, both skilled and unskilled. That has been a longstanding practice um, in the state of Nevada. That's recognized in the court case that's been mentioned. Um, and it's a very common practice between contractors um, and PEAs, uh, particularly with respect to smaller contractors who need labor maybe on a more fluctuating basis. And certainly it allows them to do uh, what, they, what they're here to do, which is to build, uh, build things um, and not to spend their time recruiting um, and dealing with administrative um, pieces. That's what the, the PEAs do. Uh, there's, a, there's an easy fix that we have submitted um, on this to uh, the record. There's a rec it's on Nellis. Um, and it's a simple amendment. It will not change any of the big issues on this bill with respect to stopping the cash under the table uh, type of employees. Uh, but it, what it will do is allow a PEA to provide both skilled and unskilled just as they can today um, and maintain that jurisdiction and control of the labor commissioner over these practices. Um, I do want to note a few uh, comments that were made earlier. Um, the case that was referenced, just to be clear on that, that was not a PEA case. Uh, that was a case with a Nevada contractor who needed some additional um, workers and hired a crew out of Texas in order to do that work. Uh, it was specifically noted in that case that that Texas crew was not a PEA. And that was one of the big problems in the case and, and why it led to this problem and led to this bill. I just I think it's important to note that because had that Nevada contractor done what he should have done and utilized a licensed and regulated Nevada PEA, um, there wouldn't have been an issue um, in that case and he wouldn't have had a problem and he wouldn't have ended up having uh, to be subjected to jurisdiction and discipline and fines and everything else um, that he paid. I also want to note uh, for the committee's reference with Dr. Wadips' presentation, he noted three categories of misclassification. None of those were PEAs. Um, they were all other types of cash under the table issues. Again, just to make the point that PEAs are not the problem here. Uh, finally, uh, there were some comments about liability, and I just wanted to mention that to you. Uh, unfortunately, I know a lot more about construction liability than I ever wanted to. Um, due to my work over the last few years in the construction defect field. But I can tell you a contractor is ultimately responsible for the work they put um, put in. And if they get sued on a construction defect basis, whether it's their employees, whether it's a subcontractor, whether it's a, an employee through a PEA, they're going to have problems if that defective work is done. And it is their license that is on the line. And that's the important protection that's provided by the contractor's board. So again, in concluding remarks, we would urge this committee to take a look at our amendment and accept it. It will accomplish all the goals of this bill with respect to misclassification. It will allow contractors and PEAs to continue to work together, and it will keep those 4,300 Nevadans who are working in construction for PEAs on the job and in their jobs, and we'd appreciate your consideration of that. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Hicks. Um, broadcasting. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yes. I, I just think I need to, to make it clear that I did get a copy of the amendment, but I have not had conversations with those that have proposed it. So I've already received messages from folks. If you include this amendment, I'll support the bill. There has not been a conversation about this yet. So I just wanted to make sure that that was perfectly clear with the members of the committee that I did not propose this and I have not spoken with folks about the amendment. And if I may ask Mr. Hicks a, a quick question, please. Yes, Vice Chair, please. Thank you. And uh, so I, I just wanna make sure because it's it's been stated that 
those on the job site are not under the jurisdiction of the contractors board. With your amendment, Mr. Hicks, would that, if there was an incident with one of the folks that one of the folks in your association sent to the job site, would they be under the jurisdiction of the contractors board or would they still be excluded? Well, Chair, this is broadcast. I apologize. I'm not sure if the caller is any longer on the line. Okay, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wanted to clarify that for the committee. I thought it would be good, um, but that's okay. I'll take it up with whoever later on. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you for clarifying um, about the amendments as well. I appreciate that. Um, broadcasting, can we go to the next caller in opposition? Yes, sure. If you recently joined the call and would like to testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 675, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. This is Johnny Skoranek, J-O-H-N-N-Y, last name S as in Sam, K-O-W-R-O-N-E-K with Square One Solutions. Mr. Skoranek? Can you guys hear me? You can start. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you can start the testimony when you're ready. All righty, thank you. Um, good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Johnny Skoranek, and I've been operating staffing companies in Nevada for the last 17 years. Uh, we're based out of Reno. My company is called Square One Solutions, and we have been oper in operation as Square One Solutions for 11 years. We are family-owned and operated. My mom is the owner, and I work with my two brothers. We focus on construction staffing, and we are, a, we are licensed as a private employment agency through the Nevada Labor Commissioner. Not to be confused with an employee leasing company or professional employer organization. Contractors should not be prohibited from using private employment agencies to augment their skilled or unskilled workforce. Every industry in Nevada, including the state of Nevada offices, use a variety of temporary employees on the payroll of private employment agencies in some capacity. It is a legitimate, licensed, and insured form of employment and would be unfair to allow contractors to utilize this hiring tool. Many of our clients are smaller operations where the owner works in the field, doesn't have time or the skills to recruit and hire volumes of new employees, especially if it's only needed for temporary skilled help. Uh, private employment agencies give them an opportunity to locate and try out employees before committing to permanent hire. It allows them to quickly augment staff or reduce staff based on project needs. The workers we provide to our clients must be supervised from the standpoint of direction of work quality of work, and safety. I often do job walks on new projects to ensure supervision is being provided by the contractor. Our workers do not work independently, but rather under the contractor's license, under their direction, and alongside their crew, performing operations that the contractor is licensed to perform. Contractors are already held responsible for the work performed by employees of a private employment agency. They act as and are considered an employee of the contractor. They do not perform work independent of the contractor's operations. While not technically on the contractor's payroll, the workers we send to contractors as PEAs are paid market wages covered by workers' compensation and general liability insurance. They have payroll taxes, Social Security, and Medicare deducted. A W-2 is issued at the end of each year, and in the case of Square One Solutions, all workers are E-verified. I would be in favor if, uh, like Josh said, um, the previous uh, opposition, if the uh, changes were made that he had suggested. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 203, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and maybe. Good afternoon again. Sorry about the confusion earlier. Um, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about this bill. My name is Matthew Wynn, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-N-G-U-Y-E-N. 
I am the business manager of People Ready in Las Vegas. People Ready provides general and skills tradespeople to companies in a wide variety of industries, including 100 workers per day to construction contractors in the state. If this bill passes the way it was originally written, those workers will lose their jobs. The people who work with People Ready are our W-2 employees, legal, and we provide workers comp, pay their taxes, we make sure they pay their garnishes. When we assign them to work for a construction contractor, regardless of the skill level, they work under the direction and control of a licensed contractor, and the work is within the scope of the contractor's license. The only difference is that we find, hire, and assign the employees for business whose core competency is building. Some of our clients, especially small construction firms and those in small and rural communities, don't have full HR or recruiting departments. Our core is to find the right worker for the right job at the right time. Our associates choose to work for us because we do work of finding jobs that match their skills. Otherwise, while working during the day, they will be looking for their next gig at night and on the weekends. Many of our employees have worked for us for years because they prefer the flexibility, variety, and dependability. They know that when they work, want to work, we will find a job that matches and grow their skills. We simply do not understand why you would want these workers to lose their jobs and make it harder for construction contractors to maintain access to the flexibility that allows them to complete the projects with the right workforce and stay on budget and on time. Please preserve these jobs for the people who most need help finding jobs and reject this bill or amend it to allow employees to sign by private employment agencies to work under the direction and supervision and properly licensed contractors. That con concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. I'm broadcasting. Next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 506. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Alvarez, and I am a staffing coordinator for Eastridge Construction Division. I am deeply concerned about AB 227, a bill that would take me from providing Nevadans the opportunity of working in the construction industry. Passing this bill will deeply affect the community we assist in getting the opportunity to work with companies that can eventually provide permanent placements. While our employees are employed with us, they are receiving benefits. We are able to continu continuously keep them busy and provide them with full-time employment. This means fewer people on unemployment and more people working, which is the ultimate goal, especially with the unemployment issues we have recently seen in Nevada. This will not only affect the community, but my family that depends on me to continuously work for the construction division. This will affect my position, and I would be deeply saddened if I'm not able to continue to help my community with construction job placements and to continue to provide for my family. Thank you. That concludes my testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of seven, seven, excuse me, seven, seven, zero. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Victor Aldana, V-I-C-T-O-R. A-L-D-A-N-A, -A. and I am speaking on behalf of Eastridge Workforce Solutions, and I am speaking in opposition to AB 227, a bill that would rob Nevadans of opportunities to work. Eastridge has been working in Nevada since 1974, and in the last three years, we have put 1,990 local Nevadans, all of whom receive a W-2, to work in the construction industry. Passage of this bill would have prevented a large number of these hardworking people from earning paychecks. Additionally, many of them have earned high-paying permanent positions at these companies due to the collaboration between licensed contractors and PEAs like Eastridge Workforce Solutions. And as an employee-owned PEA or an ESOP, our workers are able to attain ownership in our organization and have access to medical insurance, FSA and HSA programs, 401k, and a host of other benefits. They additionally benefit from the PEA's advocacy of employees and ensuring they are receiving top-of-market pay, a safe work site, and workers' compactors. Passage of this bill during this critical period of economic recovery 
and an affordable housing shortage in Nevada would not only put people out of work and deprive them of opportunities, but would also severely adversely impact an industry that has seen its fair share of struggles in Nevada. Additionally, Nevada has suffered from a skilled workforce shortage for many years, and this would only exacerbate this issue. And as the industry continues to grow and provide opportunities for good, hardworking people, continues to reach out to young Nevadans looking for a good job, provide further opportunities for women, and help diversify our state economy, the last thing we need is a bill that throws cold water on this tremendously important issue. Thank you. That concludes my testimony. Thank you for your testimony. A broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 250. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 250. Please press star six to unmute. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Mac Bybee, M-A-C-B-Y-B-E-E. -E. I am the president and CEO of the Associated Builders and Contractors of Nevada. Um, I rise in opposition uh, to this bill. Um, I've had a number of conversations with Bill Stanley, and I, and I believe him and I have a uh, common goal in that we don't want to see employees mistreated. We don't want to see... Um, uh, workers go unpaid. We don't want to see unsafe workplaces, um, and I believe we, we we share a common goal. However, uh, when I when I read this bill, um, I see that it's it, it's targeting private employment agencies, and and I don't know if it, it really resolves the issue that that's being discussed. Now, private employment employment agencies they simply they they basically work as the employer. They have they file the workers file a W four. Um, they, they W-2, they got workers' comp, everything everybody has said before. So they, they work as the primary employer until such time that maybe a contractor picks up that craft uh, professional uh, to, to, for full-time employment. Or if the individual chooses, they, they stick with that private employment agency because they prefer the flexibility. Requiring a W-4, uh, to, the, the, to file a W-4 with a contractor changes the relationship uh, that the employee has, making that contractor the full-time employee. So that individual no longer has that opportunity to be with the private employment agency if they so choose. Um, I believe that there's a number of things we can do to address the problem, and I'm hoping that we could work together on this issue to uh, create a solution that protects employees, prevents um, wage theft prevents all, all the items that were discussed earlier. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm broadcasting, do we have anyone else wishing to give testimony in opposition? Sure, there are no more callers for opposition at this time. Okay, thank you. At this time, we will move into the neutral position. Can we check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in neutral? To testify in neutral on AB 227, please press star nine now to take your place on the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 116, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Alexis Motorex, A-L-E-X-I-S. M-O-T-A-R-E-X with the Nevada Chapter Associated General Contractors representing the commercial construction industry in Northern Nevada. We are neutral on this bill as introduced and would like to thank Mr. Stanley for working with us during the interim on language and addressing most of our concerns as it was being drafted. Thank you, Mr. Rex, for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller. Chair, there are no call, no more callers for neutral at this time. Okay, I believe we also have Ms. Margie Green with us from the uh, contractors board. She was on video in case anybody had any questions for her. But um, Ms. Green, are you here to testify in the neutral position? Yes, I am. Okay. Please, when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Hodegi and members of the committee. 
My name is Margie Green. I'm the Executive Officer of the Nevada State Contractors Board. Although I've signed in as neutral, I would like to let you know that the board supports the concept of AB 227. The board has worked with the sponsors to ensure that work requiring a contractor's license will only be done by a licensee or their employee. The board's longstanding interpretation and application of all of NRS Chapter 624 has been that when the legislature uses the word employee throughout, it truly means an employee of the contractor, W-2. We have not recognized 1099 independent contractors as employees. Likewise, leased workers who are somebody else's W-2 employee or worse yet, somebody else's independent contractor are not employees of the contractor. We've have had several recent cases where a contractor has used the device of a leased labor company to compete unfairly. They can undercut a contractor who actually employs its own workers and where the leased employees were ultimately left stranded in Nevada without being paid by the labor leasing company. The quality of an employee is best assured to the public when the contractor has an inviting investment in the people it hires. To answer Vice Chair Carlton's question regarding if the board has oversight of the employees of a PEA, the answer is no. PEA employees are not licensed and this proposed amendment allows unlicensed people to work on a job site next to skilled labor. Um, thank you for allowing me to testify on AB 227. Thank you so much, Ms. Green, and thank you for um, answering Vice Chair Carlson's question. We appreciate that you noted that from earlier um, testimony. Uh, broadcasting, um, no more callers in neutral, you said, so we can now move to our closing remarks. Vice Chair Carlson, would you like to give any final remarks? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you very much. And, and thank you for powering through all the technical difficulties that we've had today. And I wanna thank the folks that presented those in support and uh, those, those in opposition, we hear your concerns. The issue is protecting the workers on the job site, making sure that they have all the due protections that they need. I believe Ms. Green summed it up very well. If something happened on a job site, those folks in a PEA would not have those protections. And that is our goal. For the folks that were in opposition that spoke about robbing Nevadans of work, taking jobs away, any of those folks, if they knew who I was or Googled me at all, would know that there was no way I would ever bring a bill that I thought would ever hurt Nevada workers from getting a good paying job, having health care, making sure they're protected at work. So I just wanna make sure that it's perfectly clear that I believe there is a solution to this. If those employees were W-2 employees, if that agency moved folks over to that contractor as an employee, we would have the public safety components that we all want on the job site to make sure that everyone is held accountable for their own responsibilities on the job site. So I'd like to thank those that, that uh, have worked over the last couple of years with all the interested parties on this bill, they will continue to work. I will stay out of their way so that they can get the job done. And thank you very much, Madam Chair, for hearing the bill today. Thank you, Vice Chair Carlton, and to your presenters for being here as well to present uh, Assembly Bill 227. With that, I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 227 and move on to our last bill for the afternoon committee. We have Assembly Bill 330. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 330, which establishes provisions governing occupational training and licensing. We have Assembly Member Ellison here with us this afternoon to present the bill. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor, Mr. Ellison. When you are ready, you and your presenters can begin. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And do you want the four hour version or the two? The two minute. <laughs> Uh, I, I will make this as fast and as, as sweet as I can. I know you guys are tired. I've been listening to the whole thing. So, uh, but uh, good afternoon, Madam Chairman and committee. Uh, for the record, I'm John Ellison representing District 33. I would like to present Assembly Bill 330 for your consideration. The measure provides that a person who receives certificate training or technical training in high school or post-secondary institution is eligible to receive equivalent credit towards an occupational license related to training as he or she receives. Uh, for the record, uh, Madam, uh, my grandson 
uh, got into this in, in Idaho this last year, or the last few years, but before he even graduates, he is actually an EMT and could go into ambulances, uh, fully certified, got his certificates, and actually he's going to go as a med back in the flights. So I, I think that's pretty neat that they can go forward on the education they want and get most of this done and take the exam at the end and pass and go forward to work. Uh, that's that's pretty neat, and I, I think that's kind of uh, something I want to see here also. When this brought, was brought forward to me, I thought this is the greatest thing in the world. That They're doing it now. They're doing it across the state. And so what we're trying to do is, is give you some information. We could go forward on this. But uh, 330 uh, provides a uh, work-based learning opportunities and career path. Uh, pathway to students and young adults to remove occupational license barriers. Occupational license required a, wo a work to hold a credential and uh, an operation of certain occupation to receive the occupational license application must meet certain criteria criteria for the form of educational training and fees and testing. Nevada requires over 50 or Nevada regulates over 50 occupationals and mostly contains title 54 nevada revised statute nrs the board of the commissioners are responsible for protecting the health and the safety of the commission the consumer to ensure high level of service yet licensed regulations can create unique barriers and change for people charge challenges for people who are uh, entering into the labor market especially those people with higher high school diplomas but less than bachelor degrees. This required test courses and fees that may stop young workers from entering those occupations. To overcome these challenges, Nevada has to help students prepare for careers, opportunities, uh, may of which end the certificates or license to careers for technical education, T uh, C E E T C T E, program which uh, are offered in by high school and pro uh, institutes, uh, and, and madam, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read this fast I can for you guys because I know you're tired. Those programs apply skilled, even every, in, I'm sorry, skilled entry level workers for local community as well as the state as a whole. Well, some boards already recognize training provided in the post-secondary uh, institute in high school the proposal of this bill is to uh, formalize and require recognition, recognition for the skills of students while preparing for this program. The Nevada Department of Education reported during 2019 and in 2020 school year, 69,213 students, roughly 14% were enrolled in this uh, CTE program students can obtain a college or career ready CCR high school diploma with a career ready endorsement, which uh, demonstrates proficiency of the career readiness assessment to obtain the CTC skills amendment certificate. Uh, industry recognized credentials. For instance, the practical nursing program provides students with the knowledge and schools, uh, knowledge and skills required to enter into the field, they're eligible for the State Board of Nursing Certificates exam as a practical nurses. During the uh, 2019 and 2020 academy year, the Nevada System of Higher Education two-year institute confirmed roughly 38,000 skilled certificates and certificates achieved. Those inst uh, uh, installments, including the, the College of Southern Nevada, Great Basin College, Truckee Meadow Community College, and Western Nevada College. Uh, and about uh, AB 330 would have a positive effect on those rural areas of the state. The National Center of, of Education Statistics reported the 2013 students from rural towns earned more than CTE credits than the city and suburbs uh, counterparts. As the, popul as the population ages, steel jobs are increasing going unfilled in these areas of our state. 
When high school students graduate, they leave the area and attend uh, pro-secondary uh, uh, institutes to fulfill the education requirement to obtain a license, many with CTE equivalent credit. They may not return to their areas. This can have a devastating impact on our local economy. Uh, in Tennessee, they passed the bill in 2019 similar to this one, the 353, which passed with no uh, objection. Uh, the summary, Madam, this bill is personally received certificate training, technical training in the high school and post-secondary institute eligible to receive the equivalent credits towards the occupational license related to the training of this received. Uh, I just got a text just now from the Nevada Autos Association called in support. Uh, they could not stay on the line much longer, so they had to leave. But they wanted to let you know that the uh, that the dealers association are full support of this bill. I wish he could have talked uh, on it, Andy McCade, but he couldn't. Uh, but Madam Chair, uh, I'd like to turn this over to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Malin, who will provide some of the comments to the committee. Following the presentation, he will be available to answer any question. Um, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, I tried to rush through it so fast for you. I, I screwed up on a lot of it, but I can tell you uh, we're working with also with the uh, Deputy Superintendent of Education uh, of Family Engagement, Nevada Department of Education, and to make sure that everybody's online and that we can make this same work. And if you look, we sent over a copy of the different colleges, the skill certificates, uh, and their achievements. And if you look that on the colleges here that's got these programs and how many has passed through here, it's, it's amazing. It's uh, some of the credits from engineering to uh, auto repairs, to technicians, to nursing programs, to construction trades, which you were just talking about, uh, mechanics and repairs, prescription productions, uh, computer, I mean, it goes on and on and on of what these kids can do in high school to help further their education and get a jump start on it. And that's what we need. And a lot of these people can't afford some of these. So their high school allowed them to do the college credits as they go. So if I may, Madam, uh, I would like to turn this over and uh, to the presenter and uh, Mr. Malin can move from there. Mr. Mr. Allison, did you say you submitted that document? Pardon, ma'am. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. The document you were just referencing, did you submit that to our committee manager? Yes, ma'am, I did. And you'll see there's a couple pages here that, I mean, it's pretty small. If you look, it's, it's all the colleges in, in, in Nevada. It's uh, uh, Great Basin College, CSN. TMCC and WNC, um, and we sent that over. You want me to resend it again? No, I just wanted to make sure. It's there. It's on now. Listen, we received the email, too. I just wanted to make sure I was looking at the same document you were referencing. So thank you, Assemblymember Ellison. And um, I believe we have Mr. Mellon here uh, with us today to continue the presentation. Mr. Mellon, when you're ready. Yes. Can you hear me, Madam Chair? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, Chair Hadegui and members of the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor, for the record, my name is Elliot Mallon, and I'm here to present AB 330 alongside Assemblyman Ellison, a piece of legislation that continues on the path of work that the legislature has taken over the past few sessions to reform our regulatory licensing agencies. First, I want to thank you and the committee for allowing me the opportunity to be here today. I also want to thank Assemblyman Ellison for bringing this legislation forward and inviting me to participate alongside him today and remembering my passion for occupational licensing reforms. Uh, I am not here today on behalf of any client, but rather because I have had a passion for regulatory reforms that can improve the lives of Nevadans and the opportunity that Nevadans have each and every day. I am aware of the unique privilege I have working within the legislature. Um, many Nevadans are not as fortunate to have this opportunity, and I like to do what I can to help others get ahead. It has been no secret over the last few years that I have a passion for these reforms. Last session, I was honored to work with Assemblywoman Tolls on AB 319, a bill that had bipartisan and bicameral sponsorship that passed unanimously and in my mind has been a highlight of my career and has already helped countless Nevadans. After the session, we had the opportunity to meet with uh, Truckee Meadows Community College, Team CC faculty and students about the legislation and listening to the stories of those 
this would have helped. And listening to those students was a remarkable experience that I will never forget. I believe that AB 330 is a natural progression of that legislation from last session. About one quarter of Americans, 25%, require a license to work per study of the National Conference of State Legislatures, NCSL. Education requirements for licensure can be extremely expensive and cost prohibitive, especially for those that come from lower income socioeconomic situations. A study by the National Conference of State Legislatures also says occupational licensing requirements, including the need to pass exams, intending continuing education and pay licensing renewal fees present significant barriers to entering a licensed occupation and can reduce the total employment in that profession. At a presentation given by the University of Minnesota, Professor Morris Kleiner in a webinar hosted by Arizona State University, Professor Kleiner, quote, found that in some cases, occupational licensing was actually a barrier to employment because of the costs associated with required exams or education, end quote. By allowing Nevadans to apply their secondary, either secondary or post-secondary equivalent education would save them not only money, but valuable time that would allow them quicker and more direct access to the licensure and thus an opportunity to get to work in a high paying career. Nevadans, uh, Nevada schools have programs in place that will help our students through their continuing education and technical training, CTE programs that are already offered by our high schools and the Nevada system of higher education post-secondary institutions. These programs will allow Nevada students to save time and money by allowing them to apply their existing and relevant education uh, background to equivalent standards set forth by the regulatory agencies and Nevada revised statutes title 54. While the intent of occupational licensure is to protect the public with public safety and public health measures and to protect consumers, we also have to ensure that the barriers that people face to get in the workforce is not detrimental to them too. This legislation would work hand in hand to keep the public safe, educational standards uniform, and to help people get into the workforce earn a higher wage while not, which will not only benefit them, but the state's economic health and well-being too. What this legislation does not do, create a system of inferior education requirements for those seeking licensure to obtain a license, a less stringent path that would put at risk Nevadans' health and safety. Instead, it allows for uniform standards that exist within education to allow Nevadans an opportunity to get ahead. A few years ago, I sat in this committee and asked you to give Nevadans the opportunity to do just that and you answered the call. I ask you to do the same today and urge the passage of AB 330. Lastly, I wanna make clear that we have, want to work with all stakeholders to make this bill great. The last thing we wanna do is create duplicate efforts or confusion. The intent of this bill is to get young adults into good paying jobs faster. I appreciate Assemblyman Ellison for bringing this bill forward and working to help Nevadans get ahead. Thank you for your time today and I'm happy to answer any questions that I might be able to um, and that I'm equipped to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mallon and Mr. Ellison for presenting. Committee members, any questions, um, please message me to let me know if you have a question. I'm gonna go first to Assembly Member Considine. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you, Assemblyman Ellison and Mr. Malin for that presentation. Um, as I was reading this bill, I noticed that it says post-secondary education. It includes Title 34, but it seems like what you're talking about are just NSHE institutions, whereas Title 34 also covers private post-secondary institutions, including a lot that, you know, will, you know, that train people or get people ready for occupational um, uh, certificates or, or programs or, you know, employment in the future. So my question is, does this also include or encompass post-secondary institutions? And if so, um, have you been working with the Commission on Post-Secondary Education or is this specifically just for NSHE institutions? Um, through you, Chair, to the Assembly Member Considine. Um, our intent is to uh, bring everybody into the, um, the tent here um, and to the table. So if we have to make an amendment or do anything to get this um, to, to advance, and we will work, we are working with everybody we can at this point in time. Um, we have done some outreach and we're waiting for some information back. Uh, but our intent is to include um, as many stakeholders as possible, including some of the private institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Sorry, ma'am, I lost my feet, but I could hear you. And that's the whole intent is, is to make this across the whole state in, in every, every high school, no matter where it is. And if you notice when they're doing the uh, the uh, cosmetology down in Las Vegas, some kids were coming out of school ready to go to work. And, and I thought that was the greatest thing in the world is uh, they were working so hard to, to get to their second education or what they wanted. And, and it saved the families a lot of money. So it's not just rule Nevada, it's just 
everywhere we can try to get this through. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ellison. Assembly member Dickman. Thank you so much, Chair Hadegui. Um, I guess this probably is for Assemblyman Ellison, but I wondered if you could just touch a little bit on how this would help. And I know you, we just referenced rural communities, but for the people who would like to stay in the community, say, and don't want to go to the city, <laughs> um, would they be able to achieve these goals without going to school at all? Actually, um, like my granddaughter, uh, for instance, uh, she was taking multiple classes at in high school for the last two to three years and taking college courses at the time. And uh, of course, you know, they change your mind all the time what they want to do. But what's good about it, it challenges them and it, it could be done anywhere. And, and I, I think Washoe is doing the same thing right now. And we're going to be meeting with them uh they were going to be here today to, to talk uh, in neutral, but they were in education at the time. But this is something that uh, uh, if you look on this list of the positions they can do and get their training, and when they get out, they might have to take a, a year of, of community college or college or whatever. So it, it, this is something good for any school, every school around the state. And I know that Vegas has got quite a bit in the community college down there because it's right there by campus. So uh, it, it seemed to be a little bit everywhere. So, but we know that we're tracking what's happening in, in the community colleges because uh, that's where we're living, but it should be everywhere. Well, thank you for that. And it, it sounds like it would be helpful to the community as well because you'd be filling positions with qualified people that you might not normally be able to attract to some of the rural communities, right? And, and uh, Madam Chair, if I can, uh, uh, my uh, son-in-law, future son-in-law, uh, just finished Yoko High School, was taking the credits and courses at the community college, and now he's already been accepted to go into uh, engineering uh, under a nuclear sub. So, uh, I mean, this opens a door for these guys where they're not in school for four years or two years or can't afford it. They can come out, take the, they already got college credit and then go right into whatever career they want with was the secondary education. Thank you so much. And thank you, Chair. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we can move to testimony and support. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone line for those wishing to testify um, in support? To testify in support of AB 330, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 621. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dylan Keith, D-Y-L-A-N-K-E-I-T-H, policy analyst with the Vegas Chamber. We are in support of AB 330. As we all know, the economy is continually requiring workers who are highly skilled in multiple facets of their occupations. We believe that this legislation works to ensure workers are recognized for their efforts to increase their skill, and we, we agree with the streamlining purpose of this bill to ensure any credits toward another related certification are also given. We appreciate the ability for workers to appeal for equivalent credits, ensuring those who have already completed courses receive all credits due, and for all boards and commissions to work in coordination with the State Department of Education to ensure consistency with these certificates. Along with the support of the Vegas Chamber, I would also like to note that our member of the Nevada Franchise Auto Dealers Association has asked me to add them in support of this legislation as well. Thank you for your time. We urge you to, to vote yes on AB 330. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, broadcasting next caller, please. Chair, there, there are no more callers in support at this time. Okay, let's move into testimony and opposition. 
To testify in opposition of AB 330, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Okay, perfect. And let's move into those who wish to testify in the neutral position. To testify in neutral for AB 330, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 888, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. The Sacramento and Northern Nevada chapter of the National Associate, National Electrical Contractors Association, or NECA. Uh, we are in neutral because we want to continue our discussion with Mr. Ellison's uh, staff to explore ways how um, registered apprenticeship programs can be included in this very important program, uh, whether it's under Title 34 or other, as was mentioned about construction trades, uh, registered apprenticeships play a valuable, valuable role in teaching careers and uh, preparing people for careers and not just a job. So we'll remain uh, neutral as we continue our discussions. Thank you. Um, I apologize. Caller with the last three digits of 888. We did not get your name. If you could please state it for the record. Sure, Peter Kruger, K-R-U-E-G-E-R. -E -E Thank you so much for your testimony, Mr. Kruger. I'm broadcasting next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ellison, Assemblymember Ellison, would you like to give any closing remarks? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Madam Chairman, and I really appreciate that you're hearing this bill, and I'm sorry I tried to pass through it so quick, uh, but Mr. Kruger's right. Uh, we do have electrical program at Great Basin College down there, and these jobs are filled before they get halfway through, and uh, I, I'm so happy that they're doing this. It's one of the best education programs we have in Elko, uh, I think. Uh, but if you look on, on section four on the bottom, it says that uh, uh, each regulatory body is in coordination with the State Board of Education. And I think that's so important. They can pick up how they want to regulate and how they want to do uh, you know, the credits and stuff like this. But I think it's an important program, mostly for these some of these young people out in, in uh that might not ever get a chance to go to college. They, they can go right to high school and be working on this and they can move in and then get start their career. So I thank you so much. And and uh, I really appreciate uh, you hearing this bill. Thank you, Mr. Allison. And I'm sorry if I made you feel rushed. We owe every bill we're hearing equal uh, consideration and time and attention. So I apologize. <laughs> but, but you guys, um, I'm you, you had a long meeting and I know that it was pretty rough on you guys and I could see it going on and I thought, God, I should have just went through the summary of the bill and got it over with. But well, we appreciate but thank you for hearing in any way because you guys got to be pooped. <laughs> well, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you, and I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 330, members, which brings us to our last item on the agenda, which is public comment. Well, we give those listening or watching over the internet um, time to call in. I'm just gonna go through a quick um, housekeeping for public comment, and I just wanna remind everyone that public comment is a time to discuss matters that fall within the jurisdiction of the Commerce and Labor Committee or the purview of the Commerce and Labor Committee. And we don't take testimony on bills that we have heard because we need to keep a record. And so we open and close hearings on bills to establish a record of the testimony on a bill. I will remind you that public comment may be limited to two minutes. Please address your remarks to issues that fall within the jurisdiction of the committee. If you direct your remarks to issues which are outside of this committee's um, oversight, I will re have you redirect your comments or terminate them. I require everyone to be respectful of committee members and other witnesses, and I do not allow um, 
testimony provided by others comment on testimony provided by other speakers or personal attacks. You may always submit written remarks for inclusion in the meeting record. With that broadcasting, is there anyone wishing to give public comment on the telephone line? Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. Thank you, broadcasting, and thank you, members. I know that was a long hearing. I just want to remind everyone that we will be meeting on Wednesday. The start time again will be 1 p.m. or upon the adjournment of oh, 1 p.m. or if floor goes after 1 p.m. upon the adjournment of floor. Um, so I will see you Wednesday at 1 p.m. And that concludes our meeting for today.